Hello and welcome to Ring Talk Season 3, Episode 11. Special one, as we talked to you before, we have brought you out of retirement, New Age Boxing Podcast. How are we, gentlemen? It's a one-off. Never really been away, you know, we're still around, we're just... (laughs) You know, like Fleetwood Mac, we're just exploring solo projects at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Going your own separate exploring. ways. Exploring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Andy having a baby. Terry having a yeah, world-class <laughs> podcast of his own. The number one. And I just hang around. No, you're with the big boys now, Martin. <laughs> Am I? Yeah. You've grown. You've outgrown all of us. Have I? You got yeah, that? I, don't, I don't even know I'm here. <laughs> the appearance for you alone was enough. But <laughs> what was it we agreed on 2K? <laughs> Um, so as we said to you before, we brought you the, uh, a one-off, which probably won't be a one-off. I'm guessing this will be a fairly regular because I just think it's going to happen that way. Um, we're going to review as we'd normally do on Ring Talk uh, the week's events and preview the upcoming. And uh, we'll throw it open to questions later on that uh, Mr. White is going to read out. And that's probably when the shit's going to hit the fan but until then that's also the only thing Andy knows about boxing by that'll, the way. Be the, that'll be the extent of my input yeah. <laughs> his usual role is to present the stuff so you've literally made him redundant Kev I know, well, I've sat him down this with brought, me but it still brought me in to be fair to Andy like I do like his like no idea suggestions and ideas towards boxing sometimes Andy's like oh mate, put a kangaroo in the ring Look, you're fucking <laughs> mad did you just say well, like he's no ideas or not yeah it's well, like yeah, he has no idea what he's talking about but he'll give suggestions that sometimes like are so batshit crazy it can be good yeah. but, hold, but hold it we're not that far off having a kangaroo in the ring <laughs> Funny you should mention that coming in March. <laughs> um, no, so Steve, uh, this weekend, uh, Boxmania 3, at your call, um, was set to be an amazing card. It fell apart a little bit. It was still a good show. Um, obviously, the main event, Joshua Egypt Povey versus Kingsley Egbeniki. Um, didn't go Joshua's way, but what was your overview of the whole fight and the, and the card itself? Well, the fight itself didn't ever take off. It probably wasn't... Um, a fight you'd like to see again um, but the styles didn't mix um, and the right man won and um, that was it really King's Egg Baniki deserved to win I scored it the same as the refs did 97-93 and that's really about all I can say about it Martin you was there as a New Age boxing representative what was your uh, view of the fight? Uh <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, it wasn't enjoyable. I got to be honest about it. Like, I didn't, uh, you know, when um, Josh got dropped by Benike, I thought, right, this might kick off a little bit now. It might kick on. Nothing, nothing followed that particularly. And then going into the last couple of rounds, I was very surprised Josh's corner weren't reading in the riot act in that corner because he was clearly down on the cards, and yet he still never came out in rounds eight, nine, ten, looking to put damage onto Egbenike and that that surprised me if I'm honest I you know it was as Steve said it wasn't a, an interesting fight and not one that people queue to watch again but good luck to Egbenike as he moves on he's uh, you know in line now for the English title at some point um he'll need a better performance than that when he reaches that level I don't think that's unfair to say no it just never caught caught fire did it Josh the style was just didn't mix didn't it just didn't it just didn't. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think Martin and uh, my dad summed up really well. But yeah, and I 100% agree with what Martin said. We spoke about it. I just, Josh just never showed the urgency in the last couple of rounds when you're clearly behind. I had Linus next to me and I said to him, if I turned around to you when you had two, ra- two rounds left to go, you're four or five rounds down on the cards, wouldn't you just drop all tactics and just try and take him out of there? And just yeah, swing. 100%. Just swing. Exactly. But he just didn't do it. So. But who was in Josh's corner? Bobby... Bobby Mitt. I can't remember. Don't know, don't know his surname. Yeah. Bobby. Um, yeah, they were younger, very young guys. Yeah, yeah. So people know that. I, I, I trained him. It might have been for his one and only fight. So, so Bobby's not a read the riot act sort of guy. So he's very, he'll do, his, he'll do his research and he'll do the kind of preparation and he'll get you to the start line. But corner to corner, he, he'll kind of stick to that script mm-hmm. without necessarily going, you're absolutely blowing it. Remember, he was in Isaac's corner for the Billum Smith fight. And you sort of had a similar energy where Isaac kind of came out the same round, did what he did before. So it's, it's just a reminder sometimes that trainers can have an important effect on the fight. Sometimes they can set that, that tone 
you know, because that's what the fighter needs to hear sometimes. It's like, mate, you have to go out there, mate. Forget all, forget what we've done in camp. Mate. You have to go out there and just fight this guy. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So. <clears throat> and I sat by his corner and I, sat, I was anticipating that at some point, certainly round eight into round nine, definitely in round 10. And when it didn't come, I was, I was surprised. Yeah, it definitely needed that change of pace and that um, you know that, that little bit of kick, but never got it. But you know, Kingsley goes on, and, and Josh uh, obviously you know will go on, and, and now you obviously look for some different opportunities for you, Steve. Um, talk about the rest of the card. We had George Hennan in a stressful week um, trying to get in match. We had opponent after opponent match out, put a gun on performance, stopping Theodore Nikolov in round four. Um, all I can say is it cost a lot of money. It cost a lot of money, and it cost a lot of money. The the, when you have to get a last minute foreign opponent, and all promoters will realise this in the UK, um, you've got to do your best for your fighter. You've got to try and get him a fight. But when you are dead in the in the UK journeyman route and you've got to go abroad in the last week, you just end up paying a, a fee that would be considered excessive. Without going into the details of that, I'm sure people at home will probably have the same question that I do following on from that. Who foots the bill? Because ultimately we know that tickets, p- fighters have to sell tickets that cover opponent, that cover the house. Well, we, don't do, we don't do that. So what happens with us? So you got to speak in, Doug. Yeah. yeah. So mouth, so mouth on the microphone. Yeah, so what, so what, on, so what basically we do, we have a set price they pay in. We're the only people that do that as far as I'm aware. Every other promoter says you've got to pay the opponent plus pay a thousand pound or whatever twelve hundred I've heard now to the house, but we don't. We have a set fee. So when we have to get, when we do this, we don't let the boxer foot the bill. We foot that bill, and so therefore that's just something that I, I don't think it's fair for a boxer to underwrite the opponent costs. They should have a deal. They know what the deal is, and whatever happens. We try and deliver a fight and it could cost a lot more money than that's not their problem. So George didn't pay any more for the fight than he was going to pay originally. But we got the fight in. But moving on to the most important part, which is the fight, he what showed masses. I thought he looked a really good talent and I thought he broke him down, stopped him in four. But I, I think he looks really decent. I, don't I, know what I haven't seen Joe, um, George Hennan since before he retired and then he's come back. Um, was it Kane Baker that he lost to before he retired? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure can't it was. Remember. Can't remember. It was Kane reason. Baker before Kane Baker fought Conor Ben. Um, <laughs> so geeking out a little bit. Um, <laughs> but I haven't seen him since pre those days, mm-hmm. and I thought he's massive. Like he's bulked up a bit. He's you know he comes from that kickboxing background, so he's clearly got a bit of you know the uh, the skill about him. But that's the best I've seen him look. You know, uh, you know given that break that he's had and now he's returned, I thought he, he's significantly improved. Yeah, he's done. He's done really well, and he's he's definitely improved. And going back to what you said about Martin, and just reiterate the point that Steve made, it's really important that when we have that set fee, we do it for a couple of reasons. Number one is the box doesn't underwrite the fight. Number two, if the boxer underwrites the full cost of the opponent, there's no incentive for us to drive the price down. So if the if the boxer has a pay into the house plus the opponent's cost, there's no incentive for us to drive the cost down because the boxer's just going to cover it anyway. Yep. Whereas if we have a set fee, there's an incentive to us to try and keep it to a certain budget. And that's important as well. And Steve said, I don't think many others do it that way now. I think they have opponent plus plus the house. If I so. turn that around, again, I'm just going to play devil's advocate sure, for no, people absolutely. at home. Does that then hinder you in being able to get better opponents for fighters? Because as you say, you're not incentivized to get the best one, maybe the most cost-effective one. Does that then hinder in some way? No, I, I'd say no. I think we'd always get the best possible opponent for a fighter, whether it be certain style, certain way. We wouldn't there drag are certain st- fighters that cost more than the others. Yeah, this it? week it was a prime example. It cost a fortune, but yeah. it was the right thing to do because it was the opponent available. And, yeah. we need to and he was a decent opponent as well. Yeah, he was, yeah. But yeah, so it was a good, it was a good, um, good, good run out for George. I don't want to spend too much on the on the, the car too much because Terry and I know Andy didn't see it, so I don't want to leave them hanging on the sidelines for too long. What, what uh, are you <laughs> insinuating? <laughs> you don't Andy, want Andy wouldn't have seen if he was there. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get him, want to get him involved. Just run through Conrad away. Obviously, he was the first one. Sam Melville putting a good performance. Another win as he takes a step towards titles. Yeah, and. Um, and the Connor Adaway Lewis Frimpong fight is one that's beckoning for March, and that's going to be an unbelievable fight. Yeah, very good fight that's going to be. It's a good performance. Is that a Southern Area title? That's the plan. 
Yeah. That's the bag. Yeah, so uh, exclusive there. Let the yeah. cat out of the bag a little bit. But it's, uh, um, Josh, someone I know you was very impressed with, Andre Descalu, Lewis Van Pooch, Ali Stonebridge um, is the manager and, and trainer. Very good performance from, from uh, Andre. Yeah, I've sung Andre's praises um, before th- uh, before this week. I think obviously po- people that follow boxing will see uh, Pooch has been a bit of a winning streak recently, uh, far better than his record suggests. And Andre won every second of every of every round. Her, uh, Louis, uh, sorry, Pooch a couple of times, and yeah, looked really good. I thought he looked brilliant. His hands are so like he's so big for the weight. The Scarlo, huge hands that are so quick. Um, well, I would say he keeps his chin in the air as he's walking backwards. His chin is stuck out there. But he's good enough to get away with it at the moment. Against Van Pooch, yes. Yeah. And I'd chatted with Lewis before the fight and, you know, are you in the mood for win today, Lewis? You're on a bit of a roll. He was like, yeah, yeah. You could see when he went in there, it, it wasn't something that he suddenly, he changed his mind about it. He didn't fancy that. And a couple of times against the ropes, he was getting hit to the body and then the uppercuts that came through. He, you could see Poochie wincing a few times, couldn't you? Yeah. You did not see that much of him. Yeah, so no, it was impressive, but I say that that chin in the air stuck out to me. Yeah, no, he is, he is a talent. I think they are aware also he's not the full ticket yet as well. So, you know, they're in- intelligent trainers. So, well, um, Courtney Fringpon versus Lee Hallett. Good performance, great fight. First of all, the away boxer, Lee Hallett, he's really improved as a journeyman and, and what a fight. He's a test for anybody. He's great for great opponent, isn't he? Great. great. And Courtney, good performance for him. A little bit slow to start. A round two, but sort of got his flow in the end and, uh, you know, put on another, another win on the card, basically. Yeah, I mean, it's um, you couldn't ask any more from him. Um, Lee had it's a dangerous fight for everybody. He gave Mikey Saki murders. Um, but Courtney ran out a, a worthy winner. And obviously, as we mentioned, the twin, obviously, Lewis Fringpong also come out against Tandenda Mangombi. I don't know if that's how you... fight was brilliant. What a great fight. <laughs> that fight was absolutely brilliant. I mean, Mangombo was... Waving to the crowd, he was dancing, Ali he was hanging. Oh, incredible. Yeah. Like, he, you know, he's 3 1 down in rounds, and uh, he's just he's leaning back on the rope, then little Ali shuffle, and then he's livid at the end when he's lost. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely raging. The photo is of him storming off at the storming end, just storming out the, off. Ring, out the entrance to York Hall. I was like, I thought he was going down the, the garage. He, punch, he permanently was punching walls and everything. Was he? Yeah. Ripped the fire extinguisher off the wall. He thought he'd won Did that, he? didn't he? Apparently, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Remind me of Andy. Actually, I thought it was a bit of his. Uh, showed the class of Andy. Um, Ellis Stewart, late Your addition diva. to the card. Ellis <laughs> yeah. Stewart, late addition to the card. Jordan Granham again, second fight out for Ellis. Just a you know routine, another win under his belt, basically. Josh. Yeah, you can't really ask much more. Jordan's probably one of the toughest gentlemen in the UK at the moment. Ellis won every round. Uh, Jordan was quite complimentary afterwards. So yeah, Ellis is young and learning. Um, Christoph Saror, um got a draw against Daryl Tapfuma. Um, I thought Christoph had done enough to nick it. I know some people had it close, but I thought he won three rounds to one. Um, but again, really good fight, actually. It was a really good test. Daryl Tapfuma come to fight. He'll learn from that. I mean, I remember Denis Denikachev getting a draw early on. He learned more from the draw than he did his wins. And um, now he's Southern Area Champion and making good progress. And Christoph will be the same. He'll learn from that draw. He didn't lose, so it's just okay. It's fine. And Pat Gill, he was also, he put uh, Paul Scaife, obviously Pat come off a draw on his last one. Um, he drew against Lee Hallett. Again, good performance. I thought he looked very improved, Pat, this time out. Um, yeah, good performance from him, Josh. Yeah, very good performance. I thought it was actually another really good fight for uh, just a, what you'd think would be a four-round bob about bit. Really good fight, entertaining. Yeah, Pat's definitely improving. And then to wrap up the card, we had Sheer Khan versus Michael Mooney. Um, second fight for Sheer. Michael Mooney does what Michael Mooney does, and, and Sheer Khan run out a comfortable in Martin. I don't know if you had an opinion of the fight, but. Not particularly, if I'm honest. I thought it was, you know, fairly run of the mill stuff, but, you know, Sheer Khan did, did enough and did well. And he improved from his first fight. He threw a lot more combinations than he did on his first fight. So he was definitely much improved. He, well, Michael, Michael <coughs> fancied it beforehand, didn't he? So. Yeah, Michael was actually, he said, I fancy beating this kid. So, and. Um, he didn't. I he thought Khan, Khan grew into the fight. He grew in confidence as it, as it progressed. Yeah. Okay, so that wrapped up Boxmania 3. You had the Frank Warren card at the weekend and you had the Fight Zone one. We shouldn't move off, yeah, I was going to say, small hall stuff. Mr. Like, Mr. Chat. Don't worry, we've got it. We've got yeah. it. So um, <laughs> we'll talk about the Fight Zone one. Um, we've got four hour any other business section. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, well, off, you go, off you go, Terry. So, yeah. Um, Kirsty Babington, nice. great performance um, against Naomi Mains. Is it Mains? Mains? Main, we call her Mains. 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 You, you call her Mains or we call her Mains? I think we should all. Call all right. <laughs> um, did you see the fight, Terry? Great great performance uh, from her. This is, uh, this is a couple of times I was probably a bit too close for comfort. 
with Kirsty Babington, you're always going to get the, that's part of the expression, bull in the China shop, right? Mm-hmm. That's what she brings to every fight. I think she caught man's off guard. But the thing is, Kirsty was taking a lot of clean shots on the way in. But once she was in and she was set, she was significantly stronger. I think both ladies... It's, so, so Kirstie's caught between two two stools, right? So you've got the 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 shelf stackers. You know, the ones they, they, they wheel in to, <laughs> to fight the prospects. <laughs> and then at the other end, you've got your, your Sky Nicholson's, your Ellie Scottney's, your Lauren Price's, you know, people who can genuinely fight. Died in the war box, has been doing it since they were kids. And Kirstie's kind of somewhere in the middle of those. And in that lane, those kind of, we need an entertaining all-women fight which may not be for a world title, but it will give you eight to ten rounds of entertainment. Kirsty will always give you that. And I think the, the young lady, Mans, will as well. They're really entertaining fight. Um, 97, 93 was how I had it. Two of the judges had it that way. One had it uh, 90, 99 to 91, which I thought was a bit harsh. But entertaining enough fight. Like For a small hall, that's what you want. It was compelling through every round because it wasn't one-sided. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, the right person. Would, would you not argue European titles a bit above small hall? Um, for, for, for the men's section, yes. I think for, for the women's section, it's a bit harder because they're on a different commercial trajectory, right? We're still trying to grow the sport in that sense. But I think the exposure is good. European title on a, on a platform like Fight Zone makes sense if we look at it from that perspective. And for Kirsty Bavington, do we think European level is the level she's at? Do we think she can achieve greater than that? You, you rightly mentioned, Terry, with the, the female box at the moment, the problem we have is there's no depth in the division. There's, there's very good and, and some not for some very good and not much in the middle. But do we think Kirsty Bavington can kick off? Do we think she can maybe grab a version of the world title or, or is the European title a level? It depends on who, who, who has the belt. So she doesn't want to fight a Lauren Price for the belt, for example because I don't think Lauren would tolerate that. I'd like to see a next against D. Allen. I, I like that fight in terms of you've got D. Allen who's been putting people to sleep in her, I think she's had six fights so far. And you've got Kirsty Bavington who's, you know, who's there to be the bully. So I think that would be an entertaining fight on any platform. And then after that, you can start looking at people, you know, you know who's got the title and see where her level's at at that point. I did ask Hannah Rankin on the night if she fancied popping down to to well to wait for that fight. She was like, I've got bigger fish to fry. Okay, so any any other fights? I haven't seen the card, Terry, so I've got no other. I if you've got any other to talk about uh, on that fight zone card. I think we could probably miss the rest of it apart from there's a kid called Connor Butler who fought at either Fly or Bantam. You're somewhere between the two. Uh, kid from Liverpool, trained by Derry Matthews. Kid looks really, 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 really good. Um, one of those that, you know, boxed as a schoolboy, really, really good as a schoolboy. I remember him with Kirby ABC and Dave Kenny telling us this kid was a real deal. And then he kind of fell off the map for a bit. And now he's coming back. So I think in that kind of 115 to 118 pounds, so sort of super fly to bantam, he's going to give people trouble. Just combination punches. Um, does that thing that people who have boxed since a kid do, where they just pick shots that don't make sense. You know, they're not textbook shots but they make him work every time. So I think, yeah, young Conor Butler looked good that night. Yeah, so he's obviously, he's 8-0, oh, he's 9-0-1 oh, now, so obviously picked up a draw at some sort of early part of his career, yeah. like you're saying, when he's dropped out. Yeah. But certainly at that weight as well, it's, uh, you know, he can run through the, the title <coughs> contention quite quickly. That's, that's Andy's favourite weights. <laughs> I'll be honest, I've zoned out at this point. <laughs> <laughs> at this point? <laughs> I'll come now. back in when I've got something to add. <laughs> yeah. um, the Frank Warren card, uh, Liam Davis fight, match on there. Anyone wants to talk about? I didn't see it, so I can't make any pass any comment. No idea. Okay. Yeah, zero interest. For Perfect. Me. It was good but, though. But, but, yeah. I, one, one thing, just to link those two cards. So we had Keenan Wainwright, who was meant to fight on the fight zone card Saturday, goes to the Wayne on the Friday, and they say, "Can you make it down to Telford to fight?" Ah, oh, can't remember the kid. Frank, one of Frank's prospects. So goes over there, drops him pretty early in the fight, and then by by all measure, seemingly got robbed 96-94 on the scorecards, which is, it's a shame, but yeah, young Keenan Wainwright's done himself no harm there, which is, you guys know from the small hall, when you get that chance to show yourself on TV, especially when you drop someone, 
you, know, you you suddenly appear on the radar. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's important, isn't it, Steve? This exposure, getting people on, and and you know, taking the big cards oh, when they can. Hundred percent. And you, we go again. You're not going to get the rub of the green on those big promoter shows against their their home boys. So you really are you really are up against it. And um, unfortunately, it's just another one that may be, a, you know, didn't get the decision he deserved. Okay, so we have sort of wrapped up last week's. We're looking ahead to three Mammoth cards this weekend. Um, the first one on Friday is the Wasserman card. Mammoth? <laughs> Wasserman? I, um, yeah, the Mammoth card. <laughs> the, the, the weekend at your call on Friday, Channel 5. Wasserman um, card. Which YouTubers? <laughs> there's, there isn't. No, it's not misfit. It's a decent fight at the top. Hardham Eubank versus Tom Farrow. I think it's that's, a, not it's a, I think that's I a good fight. I don't, I don't think it's decent. Think no, it's right not, not, not for... See, I don't mind that fight. It's just, for me, it should yeah, be like, a that's, chief support. That's an undercard it? fight. It's, yeah, it's not, sure, it's not event. sure, I get that. It's, but I still think it's a decent fight. It's Channel 5, it's free, but no, I get that. How, how many times are we going to recycle Tom Farrow? I agree. Sure. Yeah. After the O'Hara Davis beating, I, I, we found what his level was and you know, you might have to have the same conversation you have with Hollywood Josh around these. You know, I think there's some people that, you know, we should have boxing evolution, right? We should be quite Darwinian. And some people should just fall off the edge. Yeah, but a few losses shouldn't make that much difference. He's, he's at okay at a level, probably area of maybe English even, level at tops. No, I don't even think he's that. He's got some half decent wins on his record from memory. I'd have to look up exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who's what well, he's fighting? What well, Tom Fowl's fighting? Um, Harlem uh, Eubank. Do you honestly think Tom Fowl that we would um, the our super lightweights wouldn't probably some of them would beat Tom Fowl? I think they would. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. That's his level. He's but he's there, not he's the there. level because I think he loses at that level. Yeah. But he beats some wars. He probably well, loses some wars. Which is, I think that almost proves the point is that some of yours maybe would, some maybe wouldn't. That is not a headline fight on Channel 5. 100%. Irrespective whether they win or lose, if you're debating whether they beat Tom Farrell, Tom Farrell should not be headlining a Channel 5 show on a Friday night. I completely agree. What, I'm, what I was just, the point I was making is there are some boxers that are those levels. There's no shame in it. If they want to go around the boxing circuit at that level, there's no shame. And Tom, in it. yeah, Tom Farrell will give somebody a run around exactly. on an undercard. So, example, right? We mentioned Jordan Granham earlier. You can watch Jordan Granham and you can sit and go, Oh, he could do whatever he wants at this level. And he, he could move up a couple of levels and be competitive. So you're, you're never going to give him a hard time because he's doing, you know, he's well within his capabilities. But with Tom Farrell, he's been here, fellow. Been here, been here. And, you know, let a young kid come through. They'll, you know, let someone else, you know, come through. We can't keep going, oh, well, he's from Liverpool. People in Liverpool will watch because it's Tom Farrell. It's like, oh, geez, can we stop? But then Adam, Adam, it's the Adam Booth effect, isn't it? Adam Booth is very, very, very selective on opponents. He always has been. So you're not going to get him. That's the way he operates. The hoax. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, Terry? Just in general, the hoax. <laughs> um, I really like Adam Booth. I'm, I'm decent friends with him as well. He's, he's all right. I like Adam. So I'm not, you know, I try not to comment on how people are as people because I don't know them like that. Sure. But for... For where his reputation is. Yeah. Was that a New Year's resolution? <laughs> <laughs> that you started in October. 2023. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But for where his reputation is and what he's been delivering for the last few years, there's a massive gap. You know, there are others who've delivered more without being as heralded as he is. Don't you think trainers go through cycles, though? Don't you think you get... It's very rare a trainer stays top champion after champion, year after year after year after year. There's only a few... Joe G has faster cycles than Adam Butha. Has what, sorry? Faster cycles. So Joe will have a load of people win stuff and then they kind of get found out and they retire and so forth. And then Joe comes back again. Whereas with Adam, just the feedback you get from people in the gym is, number one, he's rarely there to train. He'll only train someone like a Mick Conlon because that's like pet project. And then just some of the other stuff outside of it as well where... You, know, you think you're getting the full Adam Booth treatment and then some of those exercises, you know, people who know physiology are like, these feel pretty dangerous. You know, how, look, uh, how many people have come out of Adam Booth's situation and said, I've got a really bad back? He and blocked me on Twitter as well. Oh. I mean, which I mean doesn't narrow I'm down. Not being <laughs> most people say, boxing seventy percent of Twitter's blocked you. Yeah. Elon Musk yeah. even talking about you. you came up. <laughs> <laughs> You've had so many, but you're on his radar. That's what I said. <laughs> um, me and Donald Trump back in. <laughs> Donald's back on. Yeah, me and yeah. Donald's back on. Um, so Liam Williams also on the card as well. Um, 
yeah, again, not much depth in the card, really. But um, besides that, it's good to see. They should have paid whatever fight. money it took, and I don't know what money that would be, to get Liam Williams against Linus Eudofia, headlining this card Friday mm. night, and then have Tom Farrell versus Harlem Eubank as the main support. Whatever money... I'm not saying... Five million pound, but whatever reasonable figure would have got Liam Williams and Linus Eudofia into the ring on no, Friday no, night. No, we were offered that fight, and I know. It, it wasn't. It, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. It was just not. It was nowhere near. <coughs> nowhere near enough money. Nowhere near. So that was one of the things towards the end before, which I know we we're going to do a question before their contracts expired, and we weren't going to do that fight where we what we knew was going on. We knew that Wassermans was signing Liam Williams, so it wasn't Linus going to be. It wasn't the prodigy here. This was a we're going to sell. We're gonna they were going to move Liam on and. Or if Liam, well, they, they weren't. They were Well, no, they were going to take the winner on, but but really, it wasn't about Linus. It was about making the Liam Williams fight. Now we we would have took that fight, but it had to be for the right money, and um, you know every every fight every fight has a price. Yeah. Yeah. Go on, sorry. I was going to say I'm confused here, right? Because the way you saw Callis Sowland hula hooping and jumping up and down for a bunch of YouTubers. <laughs> and I match that against the general indifference he seems to have to the Channel 5 deal. Like, he doesn't seem to try as hard for the Channel 5 deal as he does for what he's doing with the Zone X and the whole Misfits thing. So I'm almost thinking, does he regret signing with Channel 5 now? Because he's not really trying, is he? Um, that's, that's an interesting point. And that's one thing I've never thought about. Is 100%. Yeah. Don't, don't Look, forget, Channel 5 is not an out-and-out... TV deal, from my understanding, it's relied mainly on sponsorship. There's not exactly Channel 5 giving you big bucks to put the shows on. So it's not like having a Sky Sports, The Zone, yeah. or a BT contract. I think when you look at that The Zone model, they've clearly moved away from boxing as being the core product into, they've diluted it into this The Zone X YouTubers, whatever. Like there's money in that. So else they wouldn't be doing it. There's got sure. to be money in it. Because you can see that, <coughs> but the Wassermans are not signing new talent. No. And obviously, Brad Paul's line of Shadovia have now gone. And they were the two fighters that were really in line to, to have really proper fights. And um, that's now passed, but um, they haven't signed anybody else. And it, and, and it felt to me, it felt to me towards the end that they weren't bothered anymore. It, <coughs> it looks to me from the outside in, like it's, they'll use Channel 5 as an incubator to bring through a couple of talents and then move them off to fight somebody on Sky or somebody mm. on a bigger platform. So they just incubate them within the Channel 5. I think they'll probably admit that, to be fair, because like you look at Nathan Gorman this weekend fighting yeah. Fabio Wardley. I think it makes most business sense to me that if that was their, their process. Is there anything inherently wrong with them if they're doing that? No. Is that a bad model? Do we disagree with it? Mm, it isn't, but... And to be fair, if they've allowed the contracts of... Linus and Brad to lapse, then cool. Because don't bring on like decent talents without any particular aim to develop them yourselves. In my view, Harlem Eubank, if I was him, I'd be saying, What am I doing here? What am I doing here? Like, if you've got no intention of using me, why am I here? But they, but would you not argue they're doing a good job sticking him top of the bill on Channel 5? No, no hey, <clears throat> okay. I'm sure we will get some graphic put together by the Sowerlands to tell us a million and five people watched it on Friday night. Like, I would love to know the, the values behind that, but who's going to watch? Like, you're boxing fans. Are you going to watch it Friday night? No. 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 Andy, so there you go. If, if we're not watching it... I'll be there. Andy, Andy. The only people watching it are the people... Andy, guys. The people that were tuning in for Red Shoe Diaries at 10 o'clock on a Friday night on Channel 5. I didn't even know that was on. I didn't even know that was a thing. Probably old school, that. <laughs> Martin's gutted that he's being cancelled for boxing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, also, the promotional aspect of it, I, I don't think works, is because they've got your call. They're going to put you on the big screen with football, but the people aren't allowed to take drinks from the bar to watch the football. Yeah, that's so not a customer issue, that, though, isn't it? Not but, the, but what yeah. I'm saying is that's bad planning because that's not really going to work. So people aren't going to want to do that, are they? Yeah, but and people, general pundits won't know that until they get there. No, he probably won't. Unless, yeah. unless they can allow them to take him out. <laughs> the, the alcohol outside of the bar venue is a British Boxing Board of Control rule, not a yeah. no, venue. No, oh, no, it's not actually. It's yeah. no, it's only, only, if it's wait, food, isn't it? It's only food, food. food. Bring drink out your pool, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think both the people there will be fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when I, um, I press that, I, I think the top fight is not too bad. Uh, moving on, we've got the um, matchroom card, Wembley Arena. Um, did he in white top of the bill? 
Yeah. Is he the top of the bill? Yeah. Um, Jermaine Franklin, what do we think of that fight? Andy, as our <laughs> resident casual, Dillian White does appeal to the casuals. Well, let, me, let me tell you this. Do you know who Dillian White is, first of all? Yeah. He is the first name I recognise you've spoken about. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've seen everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Dillian White is all right. <laughs> However, is he? he's also on top of the pile of all the other names you've mentioned. Another boxer I won't be watching this week. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you'll be tuning in to BT, though. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no interest, Andy. Dillian White doesn't bring your no. casual head in. No, like, for me, Dillian White proved a long time ago that he was never going to be a top-class heavyweight. He was sort of like, sort of firmly planting himself and I know how much people loved me always relaying it to football, but it was like the ch- he firmly planted himself into Champions League. He's like the Fulham of boxers. He'll, sometimes he'll go wow. to the Premier League and fight some wow. fight some top weights. <laughs> then he'll get beaten and he'll go, right, relegate it back to the Championship. That is a really good clip to put out. <laughs> <laughs> Dillian White equals Fulham Football Club. Wow. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, Norwich, whatever. And it, and one of those f- teams that sort of go... <laughs> I didn't make it any better. <laughs> I made it worse. <laughs> oh, Fulham. Oh, yeah, Norwich then. What food? There's 10 players teams I could say, but it's just, it, I'd be lying. Like, ultimately, there's a, if, uh, for me, from, from, uh, from a, you know, admittedly seriously casual perspective, there's about, I don't know, five heavyweights off the top of my head that I don't think of, that I'd be interested in watching. I don't even know if there's that many, but... Give us the five. Dillian White's <laughs> only ever going to be an opponent to one of those. Um, Wilder, <laughs> Joshua, Fury, <laughs> Usyk, uh, Dillian Lewis, Dillian White. What did you say? Lennox Lewis, <laughs> <Yeah>. David Hay. <laughs> what? <laughs> Joyce, that is about for God's it, sake. Hey, Joyce. That- Absolutely not. Oh no, actually, oh, I would I would be interested in watching Joe Joyce. And really, but yeah. the curious thing with Joe Joyce is uh, that what I I don't understand is this narrative that seems to be spun like everyone's everyone's sort of they seem to be on board with this like here comes the new generation just before he retires because he's not he's he's about the same age as the <laughs> other. He, he's older than the rest. Yes. So you think to yourself, why is no one no why is no one calling them out on that? Um, I, don't, I don't really call, get call, that. Like, call, at one point we're just going to have a cliff drop of all these decent fighters and then you're going to have and then that's it you're done with boxing at that a point a big sli- <laughs> it's going to be like a big slice off the end of it and you're going to go oh okay what's going on here and I just that I think that recalls back to the lack of investment in boxing for me but anyway Dillian White that, no, I won't that is a point just to d- digress there is potentially a lack of Box office stars coming through in the sport. Mm. Would you agree? A hundred percent. When you're when you're telling me that Adam Azim has signed this long term Sky contract, part of which is him being a box office star, a three year contract. Azim is miles off of that level. Miles. He's fighting Ryland Charlton this weekend. This weekend, Sunday. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not saying that he hasn't got the potential to do that. I'm just saying that right now, someone fighting Ryland Charlton should not be in a conversation of being a box office star in the future. So if that's the best that Sky can start to build up and sell as being the next generation, they've got a five-year gap between reality and where they want to be. I, I just think that... For, I, I may be the most casual out of everyone here, you are. but on the flip side, <laughs> I'm the person... And the people in my position that these boxers should be appealing to. The I'm where the money is. Did you I, know Dillian White was fighting this weekend? No. Really? See, this is this yeah. is the DAZN problem to me. Yeah. Like, like. I, and people think I have a problem with DAZN that I get shit for it on Twitter all the time. I don't. Me. I, I really don't. <laughs> in that <laughs> Optimus Prime. <laughs> In that look, when he th- lies, th- his ears bleed. You can't see it though. <laughs> their, their schedule is so sparse that there is nothing in there for you to go and go. Here's my eight pound a month. There is nothing in there, and so when you get somebody coming out saying, um, "Was it KSI?" Was like, "Ah, oh, this is the Sky Sports equivalent." Like the zone is a Sky Sports. It's not a Sky Sports equivalent. He said, "You know, occasionally you get the side men doing a charity football match on Sky Sports, and you're complaining about this." No, like the zone is not a Sky Sports equivalent. The zone shows like 
boxing every other week from the UK, boxing every other week from around the world, that nobody gives a fuck about. Jaime Munguia, nobody has watched that fight in the UK. If you have, you're lying. <laughs> right. So, that that schedule from the zone is not enough to attract you into watching it, into you not even watching it, but paying attention to what's coming up. So, therefore, you lose that casual interest in a Dillian White. If he was on Sky Sports back in the her, like prime Hearn days, you'd have known he was fighting this weekend. Do you know what I think you. it is? Do you know what I think, the thing, I think they've miscalculated? Is the power of Sky Sports News. Oh, 100%. And the power of football. Yeah. Sky Great. Sports Cross News is huge. Isn't it? Whack it on an advert just before uh, half time. Mm -hmm. Dillian White's fighting this weekend. You'd know about it. Yeah. You don't know I about mean, it. This comes, this comes a bit to sort of zoom out a little bit. This comes back for me is that boxing is so fractured and everyone's out for themselves so to such a degree that someone like Ellie Hearn was willing to get a shotgun to his own foot and go, right, <laughs> off I go. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and then people like me go, what boxing? F what, what boxing match? What card? And then, and then people like him are like, don't worry, son. I'm all da da, and everything's gonna be all right. <laughs> and just like, what is my experience of boxing is nothing like it was five years ago. And I'm not saying that they were the good old days by any means, but. I don't have an interest anymore because I'm like, what is going on? Every every single person got this. Like, I oh, don't mind. We've got a show. Who's on it? Who's on it again? <laughs> Some bloke. Pete Johnson. Who's that? I don't, he's, he's good though. He's got a five year contract with us. But I don't know who he is. Doesn't matter. He, and that's something. Or if wheeled out this bloke that you know his name. Oh, who's he fighting? Pete you've Johnson changed again. since you've been drinking them pumpkin lattes. <laughs> <laughs> I, it just frustrates me that like I was never a born and bred boxing fan right but you know we started at the podcast and I, I got drawn into it through main, the passion of these two guys and like and just talking about it through and yeah I got drawn into it but I soon got spat out the other end when it was building 2017 and we're building I remember Terry saying to me you're not going to see the big fights Joshua until. Wilder that was a prime example <laughs> yeah until, you're not going to see it until 2020 you're not going to see 2021 2022 Joshua Wilder boing didn't happen and then eventually fury happened with Wilder and that kind of carried the narrative for a few years and then it all just got so, kind of spout again and then now it's, it's so fractured that there's a, the handful of boxers that I even care about and most of them are in the heavyweight division. And when they go, I'm not even sure how I, re how I enjoy boxing. But the fact that you've lost the interest in someone like a white, for instance, means that you lose the interest in all those who are on his undercard as well. So you lose that ability to build the next generation because you've lost the exposure of the very top highlight level. But let's, uh, let's, let's, let's really think about this. Nah, no, no, it's just about shit. <laughs> Dillian's gone from Wembley to the Wembley Arena. Just imagine he... <laughs> He's a completely different did. changing room, right? Imagine you're just going to show up to the same place. You've got to go into the little bit. To be no, fair, it wasn't him that was selling at Wembley, the stadium. Yeah. It was Fury, wasn't it? He's never well, been well, a stadium fighter. Gross Gro Gro did that against but, Christopher Rabrasso, didn't he? He but, fought a Wembley arena after he fought yeah. Gro uh, Froch. But do you remember when he was saying, I'm, I'm half of this fight? You need <laughs> yeah, to treat crazy. me accordingly. Yeah, he's delusional. Like, I'm half of this fight. You know, you can't just treat me like I'm just another opponent. It's like, well, <laughs> you kind of can that's how this game works <laughs> that's what happens when you win a purse bid so Dillian White we think obviously just a routine win do we think I, I don't know anything about Frank it looks, good, it looks good on paper but yeah, yeah 20, 21 I know American I think 14 KOs um, they keep sending him on having an upper so cut he's going to get cooked Dillian will deal with this all but if he punch yeah. a little bit Dillian's quite vulnerable isn't well, it's it it's so true knows. like I think that's almost what sells it is that Dillian it always brings excitement, yeah. At the yeah. end of the day, he got knocked out by a pensioner and Alexander Povetkin, didn't he? So. <laughs> but he's changed training. Do you think that makes any difference? And I get criticised for calling Fuller. <laughs> <Yes>. No. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I feel sorry oh, for Xavier. Rage. In all of this, I feel sorry for Xavier Miller. Because Xavier Miller comes in, he gets brought in, and they, 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 they talk him up quite right. He's a young trainer and he's learning his trade. I'm like, okay. Because I, I like Xavier. The times I've met him, he's been a good guy. And then... At every juncture, they just bring someone else in, don't they? And, and if I'm Xavier, I'm like, what's, what have they got that I haven't got? Do you, think, do you think he was right to get rid of Mark Tibbs then? Because uh, that's what, yes. who, who you yes. do. You should never have gone there in the first place. Um, 
if if you were gonna make a big change from the Miguel setup, which is what he did, and he was quite right to do that, he should have had the foresight. And Dillian's a smart man. I would have just gone with a Buddy McGirt, for example. I would have gone straight there and said, let me just get the best that I can get. I, I'm still of the view... So do you think Xavier's not the best he could have got then? So, so two options, right? You either back Xavier's talent and say, I've got an uncut diamond here. Or you go, I'm going with what's good out the box, as in Buddy McGirt. What he did with Mark is he had someone who who's been grandfathered into coaching because of who his old man was. Let's not pretend otherwise. You know, Mark hasn't got an illustrious career of coaching amateurs. He's Jimmy Tibbs' son. He's got enough money for a gym. Therefore, he's a trainer. And that's not a bad thing, by the way. Mark, Mark's a lovely man, and he knows his boxing. But there, there aren't many case studies in Mark Tibbs' career that would say, right, that's your first port of call. Okay. So do you think Xavier Miller was the right choice? Or do you think he could have got better? Because you said to him... He you, you said, do you go with the uncut diamond and Xavier Miller? It was with Xavier for what, three fights. Yeah. So do you think that was right? Do you, what, do you give him more fights? Or do you yeah. think you should have gone to Buddy McGirt beforehand? Because you said, obviously, Buddy, I would have gone Buddy McGirt and got the best. So well, Okay, yeah. so I would have gone one or the other, but I wouldn't have gone from Xavier to Buddy, if that makes sense. That's the journey that doesn't make sense to me. It's like, just aim for the top. If, if you really think you're an elite fighter and you want to put yourself in that position, put yourself in that position. If you want to say, actually... I need someone who's going to make me the fighter I want to be, and I think Xavier can do that. Then, you, then you've got to, you've got to ride that force far force far as long as you can, and it just it all his career management at this point feels a bit messy, like Joshua has, right? Like Joshua's gone from <coughs> panic move to panic move. It's McCracken, it's Angel, it's Robert Garcia, it's they talk about Roy Jones next. I was banging my head against the wall, going, "What the hell?" And it's this thing of, maybe I'm just old school, man. Pick a good trainer when you start and stick with him. Like, it's the easiest path to success. It's tried and it's tested. Yeah, I think Xavier's a good trainer as well. So be, but it's, um, yeah, it's interesting to see that. But um, So we'll see where Dillian ends up. Another fight on the card, which is a good one. Fabio Wardley versus Nathan Gorham. What do you think about that fight? Steve's a Fabio fan, isn't he? Mm-hmm. I rate him. I think he's got, considering where he came from, I think um, I think he beats Nathan Gorman. I think he he may stop him, may win on points, but I don't think it's going to be that competitive. I think he's levels above. And I think I'm not saying Fabio is going to be a world champion or anything like that, but he's definitely above the level of Nathan Gorman. Do you not think Fabio still makes some basic mistakes? From a lot, of, a lot of mistakes. Yeah. Nathan Gorman's not terrible either, is he? He's never never it's fit. Really is he? He's never fit. Fight. He's never fit. He's always fat and unfit. <laughs> It's Can't true be. though. Like <laughs> we're all laughing about it because we suddenly our minds get cast back to seeing him on the on the scales, and you're going, maybe he'll turn up for the big fights. But <laughs> he always turns up out of shit. It's just like me getting on the scales. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Think you look better, Martin. Because <laughs> it's <laughs> it's much. not that long ago that you were watching Fabio Wardley looking like Bambi or Nice sparring Derek Chisora, right? And you're like. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. And his trainer's like, nah, he's come from white collar. He doesn't. And you could see he was raw. So his focus and his dedication to getting better, you got to give him credit because whatever the skill gap was with a load of people, like I saw, I saw guys jump in there. Like I saw Tom Little play with him inspiring. Tom was just, you know, you know what Tom can get like boisterous mm-hmm. and having a laugh. But, you know, Fabio's closed the gap on everybody just by being dedicated and what I like about him is he's a nice, nice person outside the ring, an interesting guy outside yep. the ring. Yep. You, you'd happily do a day in the life of Fabio Wardley. You wouldn't be bored. And he's got a good way of selling himself. Like, I'm not saying that he's the blueprint, but so many boxers could learn from what he does. And I know it's that, that standard kind of align yourself with a football team, but he's done it properly. He's built himself with Ipswich Town. Ipswich Town promote him as much as he promotes Ipswich Town. If you're going to do it, do it that way round. Um, and you know he shouts out his sponsors all the time on social media boxers out there that don't shout out their sponsors or just put out their sponsors name as if I'm going to go and google them like as if I could be bothered to look up your sponsors you tell me who they are don't expect me to go and look up who your sponsors are Fabio does that he tells you who they are brilliant and he stayed with the same trainer he hasn't stayed with the moved on um, right, so I'm mindful of time, so just want to, because we got there, um, Craig Richards versus uh, Rich, Rick Card Belotniks. Thank you. 
That's oh, not yeah. a bad fight, to be fair. It was a nice show. Like, was it wasn't, and then he won the golden contract. Yeah. Where is but that He lost contract? to Andre. Where Andreas is that golden Avenger? contract? <laughs> Where is that golden contract? <laughs> oh, didn't O'Hara tweet about it the other day? <laughs> he did, yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, um, <laughs> so that's the metric card. We've also got the boxer card, and we've got the Frank Warren card as well. With Zach Parker, John Ryder really is the main fight. event. Good fight. That's a great, fight. unbelievable fight. I love that. Can you get best closer fight, to your best microphone? Fight the best fight of the weekend. Well. Best fight of the weekend. Yeah. I, I think it's a good fight, but I think it's going to be quite one-sided. I think it's right. To, yeah, I agree. To who? Ryder. Why are his odds against? You know, Parker's odds on. Is he really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. There's some good money to be made on John Ryder. I, I think agree. John Ryder's I about 6-4, 7-4. to, four, seven to four. John Ryder should be, for me, heavily odds on. Well, he's not. Coming off of Danny Jacobs, isn't he? I just remember what Jimmy's in. I'm back in John Ryder. <laughs> 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 that's, uh, that's a good top, fight. Top talent in that There, there are um, some questions that Terry's raised personally to me before, you know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's a really good fight. Um, uh, Hamza Shiraz versus uh, River Wilson Bent. Any interest in that? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, I right. like River Wilson Ben. I think he's all sure. right. I uh, don't rate a... Hamza Shiraz as much as BT rate Hamza Shiraz. Um, <laughs> Bradley Skeet showed his levels. That's promotion. Up, he's, coming up from, he's coming up from Super Welter to... to so he's coming up from... Um, yeah, Super Welter to middle. So he's coming up a weight, isn't he? He's been yeah. up a middle for a little while. No, he's only one fight. One just oh, okay, yeah. Um, Before the second to last fight, he got beat by Tyler Denny at Super World. Oh, sorry, I thought you were about Hamza. Um, no, no, not Yeah, yeah. so no, I, I don't... I think Hamza's all right, but Bradley Skeet made him look foolish. Yep. Um, and so he's moved I up in weight. That. And so, I, I don't know. I think that's a good fight. Yeah, it's a good fight. Um, another top talent, Dennis McCann. Very good prospect. He fights Joe Ham. Um, for the Commonwealth uh, Super Bantam fight. Any interest in it, gentlemen? Andy, I won't ask you. I thought yeah. Jim Ham would be tired. You. I've got to be honest. Yeah. yeah. I, I like Dennis. He, you know, he's one of those guys you watch and you go, I really want you to be as good as you, you fight. You know, you, know when you look at it, you go, I want to see this at all the levels. And I think this is probably the next 12 to 18 months, he's just got to kick on. Mm -hmm. you, it all looks good at the moment but we're not seeing him kind of break people down and just be destructive, which is what we want to see at this level. And then we'll forgive him when he goes 12 rounds, you know, at the sort of European world level. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Dennis is, we want, we want to produce more of Dennis McCann in this country. I think that's what we need to do. He's a, he's a very good fighter, but the, the one thing that always threw me when he first started out, they started to call him the new Nassim Hamid. That really, that, <laughs> that comparison really always confused me, but I was talent though. He's very good talent. Al Smith, his trainer, is a very good judge. And if, yeah. if Al Smith's the trainer, you know, then they're going to be matched right and, and taken slowly. So, um, There's a few other fights on there, but just to mention this, the Sky card on the weekend on Sunday, I haven't printed that off. So we're flying from memory. Um, <laughs> good card. There's some good yeah. fights on there. Zach Chelly. Really um, Lorraine Richards. Lorraine Richards. Sam, yeah, Gilly, uh, Sam Robinson, Gilly Sean right? Robinson. Very good um, the old Jameson British title. Yeah, and Azim versus Charlton. Uh, Who is then? Who's the world fighting? Sorry, David Jameson. David Jameson. Who he beat him in the boxer tournament. Ah, uh, yeah. Four decent domestic fights. I've no issue with that card at all. It's, it's, um, see, for me, that should be the bare minimum any TV yeah. show aims for. Yeah, I've, we don't see enough of those. It's a really good show. I'm, I'm looking, actually looking forward to watching it. Bit of Sunday boxing, so right. But it should be more often. Yeah, agreed. Um, right, I think we've reviewed previewed most Here comes of the main stuff. event. So we're, we're 48 minutes in and we haven't got to the questions yet. So hence the reason why we moved that on a little bit. Um, we're going to pass over to Andy. How much time are we budgeting, Kev? I don't know, just when... Because there's a lot of questions. I know, we'll have to try and keep it a little bit. I think, oh, but, um, now you understand rush. why our episodes are so long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'd also, can I just ask a question first on what your guys' thoughts are on... Um, Only if you submitted it on Steve's tweet. <laughs> on... Yeah, I did actually. I'll just let me get to it. There we go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Fury Chisora. No interest. Oh, no interest. terrible fight. No interest. Uh, Eddie Hearn, I think, summed it up was it's a great fight, or it's a good fight if you haven't seen it twice already. Just all Do you know what? No, it isn't. Yeah. It isn't, is it really? Like, if you hadn't seen it twice already, Chisora's coming off of one win in four, whatever it is, against Pulev, which he scraped. Like, Fury's on the absolute form of his life. It isn't a good fight if you haven't seen it. No, if, you, if you're not it. fighting the Wilder, the Joshua, and Andrew Ruiz outside the top five, 
there's not much choice, is there? I would, I would rather see somebody that he hasn't fought before. Um, yeah, but I'd, put, I'd personally rather see, Fury, if I was going to watch it, Fury and with Jazora than Fury, say, who did in White's fighting on Saturday, can personally. I, can, I, can I just mm. say, the, the, another person I feel really sorry for is Martin Bacoli, right? Yeah. How badly managed has Martin Bacoli been? Because I'm like, you battered Tony Yoko, yes. it, which we didn't expect, and now you're out there sparring Kevin Lorena. Like, who's managing this guy? Like, that is absolutely shocking. You beat Tony Yoka, the golden boy. You can call most people out at that point. He could have said, yeah, I'll fight Joe Joyce. And your mate Billy Nelson. He manages him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or it was. I assume it still is. I, I, I would assume so, yeah. Um, well, Jesus. Go, sorry, going back to future, uh, for me, you can tell what kind of fight it is because you just look at the opposite of what Fury's saying. When he's fighting someone good, he's like, ah, "You won't lag love on me. I'm the world champion. I'm, you know, I'm the best." I'll retire if I lose to this. Yeah, champ. To, like, yeah. and then when it comes to joy, he's like, "Well, you never know what's going to happen in a heavyweight fight. You know, you could knock me out of one punch. That's not going to happen, Fury. It's not <laughs> going to happen. Like, if Derek can even see straight after the first few punches, I'll be amazed." It's I mean, if you, if, you, if you turn it around, who's ever knocked out Fury with one punch? Wilder, arguably. And then he got back up. Who's Chisora ever knocked out with one punch? The Taka. fellow when you were... Spat yeah, 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 yeah. Spilka. Spilka, that's it, yeah. yeah. That fight and the, Takam. Let's not forget that Taka. one. Takam, oh, yeah. Impressive that knockouts. Fight it was. That fight was so comprehensive. It was like Fury had surgical knives on his gloves. You know, and Chisora was just was mess. Just went, nah. And then he walked off. Like, I don't know how many more comprehensive it needs to be before they go actually you know one more we'll do one but I had some respect for the fact that he I watched an interview of him where he kind of insinuated that it was a payday for Jazora alright I have actually more respect for and that. he did if you go back years and years and years there's a changing room clip yes. of him with Chisora going I'll give you that payday a third fight at some point in the future and now he's come through on the promise yeah. which well, you know well, just well, like he's given all the money to the homeless he likes to stick <laughs> to his promises Tyson well, Fury I just hope Don Charles gets say. paid we don't have homeless in this country anymore <laughs> thanks to Fury the Fury Foundation <laughs> kids off the street so yeah we love it Andy is, um, I love that Kevin has to like <laughs> but I, think, I think ticket sales reflect what we're saying don't they from what you can see online I've not looked at, I was going to ask the question have they lied about the ticket sales yet <laughs> it looks like it I'm, um, I'm waiting for the giveaway because, they, right, be logical about this. <laughs> what are we talking, 80,000 at the Spurs Stadium? I think, I think they said after about a week they'd done 50,000. In early December? Like, to me, look, there's so many red flags around this. And I'm not going to say red flags about what. <laughs> <laughs> but, look, right, if you hire out a stadium, a state... Like, I don't think this would fill Wembley Arena, let alone Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Um... And yet you've hired out a stadium, you're going to turn up and I'm sure it will be full, but that does not equate to a sellout. And so therefore the costs involved in all of this, the pay-per-view buys are going to be minimal. Like, the, the, <laughs> there are flags raised <laughs> high above Tottenham Stadium that night that I would worry about. <sighs> well, we've, had, we've had 10 minutes, we haven't even had a question yet. Was... <laughs> That's how depressing it is. Um, right. Okay, here we go to the questions. Right, I, I, I'm, who am I directing these questions at? Am I just going to brawl? You've done this before, you know what? Uh, you're the pro here, Andy. Yeah. Come on. Well. <laughs> <laughs> it was sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> this has got to go to one of you three, but is this the end for Ring Talk as a weekly entity? It's hugely missed. It's hugely missed. Question mark. I don't know why that was there. That's, don't put a question mark on it. It's not needed. In it. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't get told off for asking questions. Oh, they're not going to ask another one, are they? It's, it's, it's just punct. I mean, it's unnecessary. Let me have a look. Okay. <laughs> Who is it? you got to tell. Is, is, shout is out. this the end... Is this the end for Ring Talk as a weekly entity? If you're, Question mark. If you're going to mug off Separate their punctuation. Sentence, it's hugely missed. No, not the end. This is just a... Better Q bank. Separate. Addition. addition. It's addition. Yeah. No, we're going to... We just spent all the money on this equipment. We're definitely going to run it every week just to get the value out of it. Just there. Rather than... Uh, but no, we're Ring Talk was to carry on every week. We just thought we'd... Will you three clowns They just upgraded <laughs> me to you, Kev. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Thoughts on they can deal with illegal cases. <laughs> Thoughts on Dion Juma's untimely retirement? Another question. Steve, Mark. this is a good one for Steve. I'll help you out here. It's a good one for Steve. Okay. 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 Right. Okay. So Dion, Ju- I'll just give you the Dion Juma story. So Dion Juma um, finishes with the Sowlands. He's nobody wanted him, and I was called in to build his career up. So I did. We built it up. We won uh, Southern Area English, got him to a British mandatory position. So he's now mandatory for the British title. So that was done. The mandatory for the British title was done under my watch. So I've done, we've done that. So three year contracts up. Yeah, I'm renewing, I'm renewing, I'm renewing. Then he rings me up and says, no, I've changed my mind. I'm not. No problem. You're gone. Um, he then has one fight at... Uh, I think it was at a nightclub. And then he fought React Paul for the British title, which was totally the wrong fight for somebody that is susceptible to uh, big punches. So I would never, I would have avoided that and waited for a bit of option, but there we go. And he got beat. And then he retires. And that's it. So <laughs> what are my thoughts? My thoughts are he probably should say thank you to me for all the work I did for it, him, but we won't get that. But there we go. Go there. Go there. <laughs> Let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> the injury the injury ultimately is what's kept him out for Dion, which is uh, unfortunate for him. You never like to see anybody. And I uh, think, so it's unfortunate. I think he's going to go down as a waste of talent for me as well. Should have been a British champion at least. Yeah, yeah very, very talented I'd boxer. I would is agree. It, is it a case of wrong choices at the wrong times or something? No, to be fair. Well, to be fair. The hoax strikes again. The, to be fair, the, the, the mistake that was made, in my opinion, is once we got him to the position of mandatory for the British title, and I was then not involved, the choices were made. And he's, that night that he fought the Yankpaw, his good friend Sean Earls and everybody from West London, they were all at your call. And I said, I would not have done this fight before the fight. And Sean Earls said, oh, no, it's the right fight for him. I said, well, see how good a manager I am, because I would have swerved this and got him somewhere else, because he gets stopped. And he got stopped because it's what I predicted. Because I wouldn't have done the fight. So I think if I was, if he had renewed with me, because I'd done such a great job for him, we would have navigated him in a direction where his defining fight he may have won rather than lost. T, you rate him, didn't you? As an amateur, I don't think anyone's going to get close to him, right? So, so that's the deal in Juma I remember coming up where you're like, wow. Um, and you almost look at him like. Can he make light heavy? That was always the question because he boxed mm. at 86 in the AMS. That's when he was at his best. So you're like, could he make light heavy? Then he powered up with the hoax. And then his career just kind of got lost in that kind of etherness because obviously he was friends with George, right? Mm-hmm. So that gave him the in with Adam. And then his career got lost with the Sowlands. That's the rule, right? Always stick with a British promoter if you're a British boxer. I think if he, even if someone had gambled on him like uh, at the time, like a Frank Maloney, he would have done better. He... He should have been British level years before he met you, Steve. If you see what I mean. Yeah, I agree. I yeah. agree. And so when he lost those development years, a bit of a bit of Dion Juma was lost there. Mm-hmm. And he was almost fu- he was fighting on on what he had learned a while ago without really developing and without really hardening up as a pro. And that's why, like you said, he was susceptible to those sort of react poor shots. Because mm-hmm. he hadn't he he'd never really been in those tough fights where he could sort of callous his body to take him but it's just it's a real shame because Dion's an okay guy considered guy relatively quiet guy you know you can bump into him in West London nice guy can talk about most things but like Josh said we never saw a peak Dion Juma mm. and that's a tragedy Agree. Uh, probably a bit of a quicker one uh, three of Steve's current promotional stable he thinks have a British title in them and how soon <laughs> I hate giving names. Oh, I think the, f- the f- top two are quite obvious. Come on then. Linus and Brad are going to be the <coughs> other closest. Yeah. So we'll take Linus and Brad Paul. One, then. two. One, two. Which is the third one? Well, he's asked for three. Maybe you just give him two. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no one that would you'd consider at the moment. We got so there's, many. There's so many that there's so many, many that one future. southern areas are going up to English, and it's really hard to say which one's going to... We mentioned George Hennand earlier today. 
<clears throat> he's got to conquer the Southern Air in English first. So I don't want to label British Championship yeah, level on enough. them. Yeah. And we've got some, you know, some really good, really good kids. But I need them tested at a higher level yeah. before we can say anything about British titles. I think fighting for British titles is too many trainers who I think you would agree, wouldn't you? Throw this around. And I'm amazed at how many trainers, by the way, say this fight is British level and they've never trained a British level fighter. <laughs> so how do they know? <laughs> exactly. that, that's my, that's yeah. my favourite comparison. That's Josh, you, that, by the way, I stole that from Josh. <laughs> I said people say he's going to be world champion, but if you've never been around a world champion, how do you know what world champion looks like? Oops. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough, yeah. Okay. Uh, Steve's plans promotionally moving forward. Survival. Um, yeah, it did see, strike me as quite a general question. But <laughs> I think survival is the um, is the only um, thing because a small hall now. I mean, we promote at your call, um, and <coughs> we're now limited to ten fights by the boxing board. Your call now raising their prices substantially from next year to rate, and it's just another cost and a nail in the coffin of of trying to promote. So we've absorbed so many costs that have been levied on us in the last two years without passing hardly any on to boxers for t decreased ticket sales, but it's going to be impossible now. So, I, I, you know, I think, I think that I predict 30% of promoters will no longer be promoting next year. What, what, what does top-level boxing do without small hall? Is it... It's, it's, it, it, it needs... It Is it an ecosystem? Some, yeah, because you look at the... Again, sorry, everyone, but you look at the Premier League, it, uh, they, there is some look at trickling down that money into the lower divisions it's because otherwise they won't survive be that you know it's not perfect but there's some look at it because as martin says it's an ecosystem if small hall boxing just disappears overnight i don't think it'll ever disappear overnight i think you'll see a, a smaller version of what it is now in the, yeah. over the next couple of years well, we were told we were told say nielsen who are doing a lot more promoting they had a your call show which apparently had about 350 people in it Ooh. they must have been now, you, you do the numbers. It's 21,000 to stage an event there. It's just impossible to make that pay. Now, obviously, they're keen. They're for, I think, I mean, but they're good people, by the way. Yeah. And um, they're throwing a lot of money at it. But you can't do that forever. You just cannot. And a lot of other promoters, when you're trying to do it like we're doing, which is every promoter is self-sufficient and it's trying to run on its own legs. There's no massive sponsorship. There's no money that's coming from the clouds and you know and you don't know where it's dropping from we you know and so <laughs> it's we're trying to do it with you know on a, on a on a proper basis and it's really difficult now and i was saying to terry um off camera because we've had this discussion going back years the problem that you've now got as a small promoter the ticket selling is paramount now over over the ability of the box. If you can get both, <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. If you can get both, it's wonderful. But you can't have. There's no point us having a boxer who can't sell tickets, no matter how talented it is, because we won't be running shows in 12 months' time. That's how bad it is now. To give people a, an idea, I have a number in my head. But what's the without paying anyone? Just to get like the venue, the 21,000. 21,000. 21, so, so then you start paying boxer and boxer. Mm -hmm. so I'll, ten I'll, give you, I'll give you the numbers. So, 10 fights on, you're trying to collect, if possible, about a thousand pounds off each boxer. So, the 21,000 goes down to minus 11. Then you try and sell tickets to your own customer base that you've had for years, and you might sell 5,000. We may do five, six thousand. You're if, now minus... If you're lucky. Yeah, and that's a good day, right? If you're lucky. Now you're minus five. You then are dependent on the boxers selling more than their quantity. In other words, going into the... Once they hit a certain level, they go a 50-50 split with the promoter. So you're then desperate for the boxers to go over. So they've got to be good ticket sellers to narrow the 5,000 gap. We go into every show on a negative. Can I just add one thing to this? And yeah. this is what I talk to guys about. And I always... I try and explain this to them. And I think actually describing Steve as a promoter is probably the wrong word. I think we need to change that because my attitude is this. If I'm bringing a boxer to Goodwin, really I just need the platform. I need Steve's platform. Don't need, don't need Steve doing anything. I just need Steve's platform, right? And in exchange for Steve's platform, I need to bring a certain level of interest. And that interest is reflected in pounds. Right? It's not reflected in talent. It's reflected in pounds. 
And so if I show up at Steve's door to get signed and I haven't put in two or three years of real graft, shaking hands, kissing babies, being at amateur shows, saying, look, come and see me when I turn pro. Like, I'll tell you who does that well, a young kid called Jordan Flynn. Like, if you ever see him on Instagram live, look how many people are watching him live, talking to his mates. And it's like seven, 800 people, which is insane. And so he, he does it really well. And you know, he gets his brothers out locally selling tickets. So I like what Jordan Flynn's doing. But a lot of guys are like, I'm talented. Steve should be honored that I'm on, that I'm on his show. I'm like, shut up. That's a platform, right? <laughs> you, you, you bring 120, 130 tickets to Steve, right? Steve's job is then to take you and go, look, I've got this kid on my show. He's this, he's that. And Steve does the stuff in the background. But it's just a platform. Goodwin Boxing is a platform for young guys to come on, do their thing and go out. Like for me, the best case scenario would be a kid comes up to Steve and goes, look, I reckon I could do 300 tickets for every fight. How quickly can you get me to area level? And then Steve goes, five fights. Okay, cool. I'm going to deliver that for five fights. Even if I left you after then, you're happy because you're like, no, 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 he did what he said he was going to do, right? That's how business should be. And a lot of these guys are going there going, Steve should build me up. And I'm like, no, he shouldn't. Mm-hmm. Steve should build Steve up. <laughs> Steve, what, we, yeah. what we're trying to do, though, we are trying to... What we do is you're bang, you're bang on right, but as we are trying to get the fighters off our shows. Because if a fighter comes to me and he's got 300 tickets and that's what he sells, I'm going to be able to get him off our shows and onto a TV platform. So that's what we're going to be able to move him. I consider myself a manager that has to do these shows t- to give them a platform. But the idea is as soon as we possibly can, if they're delivering, move them on. But it's almost like the next tier down to what we were discussing with the Sauerlands earlier. If the Sauerlands incubate them on Channel 5 and then move them on to Sky Sports, to Zone, wherever exactly. it may be. But they're selling them off in the away corner, though. Yeah, you, you want, want to be get them a proper corner. contract yeah. in the home corner. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. so let, let me provide a live example. Kid that I trained from the start, Courtney Bennett, turns pro December 9th on the Alfie Warren show. He went to Sky initially. And Sky, like, okay, cool. But what he wanted to do in his own head, he said, I just want to show what I can actually sell. So he'll probably go to York Hall, and I think he'll probably do a quarter or a third of the tickets on that night. Yeah. You know, like, even I've had to pay for one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I, I build them up myself to pay. Human. <laughs> you're that high value one as well. You're ringside. Yeah. I know what you're like. Yeah, I'm an idiot. <laughs> so so he, he'll go in with that ticket sale. And, and in my head, I could always say he'll always be good for 150. Right? So then you now go to Sky Frank and say, look, we can do this in London continuously because of the years he's put in. Like he's, he's been an amateur since 2013. So he knows everyone. And you'll bring all the right people in. Not enough guys do that. They go to the gym, they sleep. They just waste all their hours on PlayStations and whatnot. They're not even on Twitch promoting themselves. You know, what I mean? they don't do anything to drive value. So I can understand why Steve's annoyed. And I've been saying that for years. Where, where you know, I come to a Goodwin show, and I'm like, then I'm like, these bastards don't appreciate what he's giving them right now, and they're not grafting for it. And I get angry at that. Because they've got an opportunity to change their lives. Do you know that? But this is going back to what to tie what I was saying together before. If small hall boxing is relying on on essentially goodwill at this point, like Good friends win. and family, I know, like like if you come, and, it sounds to me like you come out of a, if you come out of a, a small hall event, you like that, and fifty quid for me, yes, like that. How's that? How long is that sustainable? And if boxing is an ecosystem, uh, you, that's not going to last forever, because. There might be people like you that have the heart in boxing, but that's not going to last forever. And, and eventually, you, there's not going to be new blood coming into it because what's the point? So that will eventually affect the top line of boxing unless it's not an ecosystem. That's there, what I'm trying to understand. Well, there, there will always be some where money is not the concern. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be very hard next year. To wrap up next year, going forward, it's going to be really difficult. You're going to see lots of promoters... <laughs> I love, Pro- I love promoting the, uh, shows when Kev, when Kev comes in it's to stop yeah, something that's else it, yeah. being said. let's move on <laughs> yeah. though, Dwayne Sinclair man he's always the one that sticks out in my mind like Dwayne used to turn up when he wasn't fighting at your shows he would turn up with Dwayne the Hotshot Sinclair leaflets Absolutely, yeah. and go and give them he'd put them on Absolutely. every seat around ringside yeah. everyone who left York Hall that night if they hadn't heard of Dwayne Sinclair before that night would have heard about him when they left Absolutely. 
that little bit of initiative, you know, he's a financial advisor now, isn't he? He's clearly got well, a little more, mortgage, mortgage broker. broker. Mortgage no, broker. No, Whoa, no, no, don't it, start on totally that. Totally different. Oh, so, my He's word. a mortgage broker. I'm in the wrong room for that. It's uh, like calling you a blogger. Do you know what I mean? We got to <laughs> I embrace it. It's we'll get our, pronoun, we'll get our pronouns, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, he's a financial advisor, right? Uh, uh, he's... <laughs> <laughs> he's a mortgage broker, so he's clearly got that bit about him. He, he's a he's a clever bloke. He used to turn up and do that when he wasn't fighting. I always thought that was a brilliant touch. Absolutely, yeah. shout out to him. It's right, Joe. Come on, Andy, let's go. Roll okay. on. Okay, um, this is from Paul Altai. Uh, shout out to Paul. Um, if Conor Ben had been your fighter, Steve Goodwin, when all this came out, would it have been would would it have been a distance yourself from it all or fight his corner kind of situation? He's but failed to drug test. <laughs> However, before you start preaching, yeah. we had Ali, you had Ali Adams when he failed his test. But, but, and you worked on him afterwards. Hold on, hold on. Ali Adams, so I'm going to give you an example. I had a boxer who failed a drug test. Back in the day, Ali Adams fought Audley Harrison and he was done for steroids. And... The, the thing was, he was done. Now, I didn't profess his innocence. I didn't say he's innocent, he's going. But I have a duty to represent him at the hearing. But he also said he was innocent to you. He said he was innocent to me, but I... I mean, we, no one knows until you go through the full hearing. But the but the b- bottom line was, I wouldn't go out in public and say, he's innocent, it's all contamination, it's all this, it's all that. Because if you've got steroid in your system, you've got it in your system. And they then... And I was told, I was told generally by somebody who knew him who knew him, that he had taken it and how he took it and everything else. Now, the point was, I, d- I then had to, I went to UCAD, I represented him at the hearing, he got his ban, he served his ban. When he served his ban, he came back, I, promoted, I put him on our shows again because I didn't fall out of him personally. But if, like something else, if somebody gets done for hitting somebody and gets put in prison for 18 months, it doesn't mean when he comes out of prison in 18 months I'm going to ignore him, but you serve your time for what you do. Now, Conor Ben needs to serve his time for what he's done. But none of us know the full fact yet. No, but but, but but, but then you can't profess innocence. This is the point. But but we know the facts that matter, right? But this is the reason we don't have people vouching for each other. We have drug tests. Yes, exactly. It's a case of like, right, does anyone know if he's taken drugs? <laughs> no, he hasn't taken any drugs. Brilliant. Why do we ever use those tests? What's the point of that? If you guys are all saying that he's clean, then that should be fine. Like that's what exactly. we don't. We use tests. They're binary: fail or pass. And then you pass. You fail two of them, and then you go. Oh, I don't know what those tests are about, mate. Me and all my mates know we haven't taken anything, don't we, boys? Yeah. Like, no, sh- n- none of the promoters criticise the test when they pass. Yeah. <laughs> none of them go. Well, these tests don't work. Everybody's passing. It's only when they fucking fail there's an issue. That's a really great point. That's a really You're, good point. I mean, Terry's hot on this subject, aren't you? So, Look, the rules are simple. There's stuff that you shouldn't have in your body. Yeah? And the anti-doping rules say that. It's, it's strict liability. If it's in you, you're in trouble. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's on Connor to say, well, it was in me, but I don't know how it got there. But it's in you, Jesus Christ. Like, just hold your hands up and say, guys, it's in me. Let me just take my, because he'd have had a six month ban, probably backdated to the first test. He'd have been good as gold by the end of the year. But he let his ego get in the way, not realizing that his brand is already damaged, that Conor Ben brand. And you won't recover from this because anytime people don't like you, they'll just go, you just as drugs cheap. I think yes. though, my understanding of you, Cad, if you openly admit taking um, banned substances, you'd be very, very lucky to get I don't think ban. you have to openly admit it. I think you have to say, hands up it's in my system I can't tell you how it got there I didn't inject it but if we're all going to play this game I'll accept that it was in my system now yes. let's now let's come to an agreement but they wouldn't get a six month ban They're, they need to come up with an excuse four for years it. then isn't it yeah, yeah they, need to, they need to have a reason to reduce the ban ah if I could just sue them then <laughs> like that's clearly the other <laughs> option I've just got which is <laughs> irrespective of any test if you have more money than you can have then you just Dilly and White and Tyson Fury them I just got this image in my head now of a, of a boxer peeing into a cup and them going, "Yeah, you've passed," and he going, "Yeah, nice one. That's faulty. <laughs> what? Nothing. No, no, no. That's, that's definitely right." Yeah. But when you talk about money, though, it doesn't surprise you. The biggest sport and the most, the most financially powerful sport in this country, football. You never ever Nobody. hear of a failed drug. Nobody failed. I, I, I heard right a story about TUEs, and it was they, it they was don't about mess around. You get your TUEs as soon as you sign. It's like, mate, 
you've got asthma, you've got hypogonadism, you've got bad blood pressure, <laughs> you've got a bad heart. These are all the things you've got, right? And you got them after you pass the medical. <laughs> There's your TUEs. You're good. You got them yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you got thirty something year olds at Liverpool looking like 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 seventeen year olds. Fourteen of the first, like fourteen of the first team squad all have asthma, like sixty. That's that's the one that always gets me average. asthma. Do you remember when you was in school and you had a kid that had asthma? Like he couldn't he couldn't walk up the stairs like before he needed to hide it. Now yeah, you've no, got like world class athletes that's no, got asthma. Nobody it's took like it to the kid. Nobody could t- took it to the kid who ran a hundred meters and went, Why don't you have a go? Yeah. Look, he can't walk up the stairs unless he takes it. But when he, he takes it and then he can walk up the stairs like a champion. <laughs> you can do the hundred meters in like that. You take this and like Dream it, believe it, achieve it, baby. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, okay, let's move on. Let's move on. on. (laughs) Uh, John Bailey, uh, how does your outlook for small hall boxing in 2023 compare to 2019? Bleak. 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 It's bleak, bleak, bleak. Your views on the performance of Sky, Boxer, DAZN, Matchroom, BT, and Queensby have kind of covered that. All diluted. Crap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and 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 well, if we look at British boxing's anchors, Sky, right? Like Sky generally tend to do the biggest shows and the biggest numbers. And I'm not going to say they're in disarray, but they're a year, just over a year in now, and they've just gone. Our roster's terrible. Yeah. And so you're going to see. I think they're signing people to three and five fight deals. You're going to see them just start trying to get people off the books pretty soon. I have a credit to them. This Sunday is a very good show. Yeah, but if, sure. if you look at the guys who are making the show worthwhile, they weren't part of the original stable. So no, but they're only, as you say, 12 months in. Building a TV stable takes longer than 12 months. That's why I think Sky's product hasn't been the greatest yeah. overall. And so the challenge will then be, who do you bring on board? And I, I, I still have a feeling you're going to see brother and sister Dubois on Sky pretty soon. But what you need, though, Terry, it's all right having these names, but you've got to have the fight. So... You need to have more English title fights on there. It's fights that we can watch and be excited by because it's great to watch Caroline Debar beat everybody up, but that's not what we want. We want to see, like the, listen, Sam Gilly, Sean Robinson, neither, in my opinion, are ever going to be world champions, but they're going to bring a competitive yeah. fight on Sunday. <coughs> and, and a good support. It's going to be really good to watch on TV. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a perfect fight. I said this the other day to you, Steve. We are having this conversation about, and I actually nicked the idea from Terry from years back, about... I think, in my mind, you should limit the number of promoters you have in the country. And It's the same argument you made, Terry, years back about you should limit the number of professional boxers you can have in the country. In that I think you should limit, arbitrarily, uh, don't take it as gospel, but say five. Call it seven. I don't really care. Boxers? No, no. Promoters. (laughs) An odd number as well. Right, your turn to sit out this week, (laughs) Pete Johnson. (laughs) Because but I've five, been in White's opponent in a couple of weeks. Five is all that Andy can handle. <laughs> so, so five, call it seven promoters, right? And you bracket them by what their total annual budget is going to be. If their total annual budget is going to be 250 grand, you fit in that smaller one. If it's going to be up to a million, you fit into that middle one. And if it's over a million, you're in that higher end. And who's going to fund it? Because the boxing board will go bust. No, it's not about the boxing board. It's about the promoters still funding it. So you say there are allowed to be seven promoters, right, in this country. And so that allows, you've allowed three in that lower bracket, two in that middle bracket, and three in that top bracket. Call it eight in total, right? Because then you start, the thing you said a second ago, Josh, diluted. Yes, Mm -hmm. it is diluted. If you only allow three of the, call it two of the top promoters, three in that middle bracket, three in the bottom, whatever it may be, you then have to force boxers into promotional stables. Once they're in there, you have a better chance of making fights. Fights don't happen, partly because some boxers may not find it financially viable to do the fights, promoters may not have the money, but also you get stuck with these stables and these uh, broadcasters whereby boxers can't go platform to platform. So either you bin off the idea that promoters live with platforms... Or you limit the number of promoters to me, and then you squeeze people into areas. But, but you're arguing for some, some sort of structure. Some, and there's no organisation. Some governance, there. God forbid. I like, like, Joe, I like the idea of a draft, the, right? So every yeah, year, every year, yeah. the, well, every that, year again, the board that's organisation, isn't it? A, a set number of licenses every year, right? They go right. Here's the number of licenses. These are the new boxers who can come on next season. 
and then the promoters go, I don't know, the top guys may get the first nine. And then, then it goes out on a promoter. By promoter. I, get what, I get what you're saying, but boxing doesn't work like the NFL or the NBA do. It's, it's a completely different setup and organisation. Yeah. But that's, you, that's, but you, that's, ne- that's just never going to happen worldwide. It's just so not, change your no, no, but, but in Britain, it but could if you though, do right? that, No, because then if, if you're limiting boxers to that sort of choice, you'll just see more, more go abroad and stuff like that. If they're going to be limited to a draft where and so they, they, have, they have no say if they're going to go to Frank, Ben or, or Eddie... Yeah. They're not going to do that. Okay, but where are they going to where are they going to go and sell tickets? But you have the likes of the Olympic gold medalists that are the ones that will be going through this draft system that you're. Yeah. But, but I, I would imagine I don't know. But pre the draft system in the NFL, people might go. Well, you're telling them they've got to move to Philadelphia. They're not going to do that. But actually, if you force the issue, but they, they have could, no choice. But if they if they if they don't sign up to that draft, they have got no other options. If they want to earn the big money, being in the best league in the world, they have to do that. Right. So if you have no option but to box in the UK but by you going through the draft, system. but you wouldn't. The, the, the top boxers can do what they want. Anyone would sign them. But that's the point: is that you don't allow that. Yeah, but, like, they, yeah, but I think they'll go to Germany. They'll go to yeah. uh, the US. They'll go. No one's gonna. No one's gonna watch an amateur who's just turned over in Germany or the US. No, but you've seen a British. But Southland's where a European powerhouse. They did sign English boxers. You've seen gold. No, and it never worked. But they've done it and they built they build them up. Tell me one that worked. Humor? No. That was in that A go go? No. It was injury. No. It, it's hard. I, I genuinely think there's a monopoly. Every country has a monopoly because as Steve said, you've got to sell tickets. Where am I going to sell tickets in Paris? Honestly, where am I going to sell? I'm not going to sell tickets in Paris. But no, but the Olympians doesn't sell tickets. That's the point. Uh, they don't need to. It's the, it's the rest of the and card. They, and they, they wouldn't have it. to. They, they go to the top promoters, presumably. Sure. They would yeah. be the first yeah. 10 that get picked out of this draft. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm like... You, it's then the next yeah. 20 for you lot are fighting over. <laughs> even if it risked... Well, it would be, wouldn't even it? Even if it risked bringing the, the very top level of boxing in this country that, that's down by a smidge, I think it would be worth it just having some sort of organisation. But, but you also got to remind the, it's the British Box Board of Control. They're not... It's not a household brand. It's not like the Premier League. It's not like the NFL. It's no, not like the NBA. No, but that's partly due to its governance of that. I mean, we spoke before. If you theoretically, you can set up a perfectly legal boxing match in a car park. Yes. If you go through the requisite stages of filing paperwork with the requisite people and just go like, oh yeah, this bloke's having a fight with this bloke in a car park. Under the, no, that's under the <laughs> Andy White Board of Control. Yeah. But, but that's actually happening. Like, which, is, which is just so... I mean, all right, I suppose... Theoretically, you can do that of a football match as right, well right. under a different. Uh, uh, but it's the, the the levels of risk involved with boxing and the levels of of well, from a consumer perspective, the the mess that it is in boxing would would really would really uh, benefit from some sort of organisation. See, see, I think the, what the, the, one of the biggest issues with boxing, especially in this country, is the obsession with the with the undefeated record. If people accepted that losses are part of fighting, which they are, people wouldn't be so obsessed with fighting Joe Bloggs versus a foreigner from Mexico who's going to go 12 rounds and be in a one-sided uh, boring fight. Uh, 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 if you I, got past that, then I you... Don't you I, 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 don't, I don't disagree with you at all, Josh, but I, I actually think there's a misconception that there is a um, fascination with this. But yeah. there is. There is. Anthony Josh has now lost a couple of fights. People are now saying... People, my friends, and speaking to casuals like Andy... <laughs> and, I was, and I was saying no offence <laughs> just, just to remind everyone that Andy's the guest <laughs> Andy Joshua saw that day you? since he lost his own yeah he's lost one but he's lost two. but he's not the same for people who haven't uh, this, they do not have the same interest in no he's not defeated knocking everyone out like he was mm. a superstar it's a knockout that's, thing I think that actually yeah. that, that's, that's a fact I didn't now have he's lost an a few interest fights. in him when what? he was diff- undefeated fighting Matt Legg at Wembley yeah, but most people did but do you remember what was being said about him Eddie was like, this guy's going to go his whole career undefeated. I don't see anyone who's around right now or who's coming through who's going to be Anthony Joshua. He told us this was our version of Mike Tyson. We're annoyed because he's not what we were sold. Yeah, if but anyone that knows boxing knows that was okay, true. I and that's a promoter's but, job, right? No, but, sure, the, yeah, but, but the people you're promote. referring to don't know that, do you? Yeah, but he's trying to say it to the casual fan. Oh, yeah. good, he's going to be unbelievable. Yeah. But there is, I, and that's who slaughtered him. But I, to, I have more interest now in Wilder than I did before he fought Fury, which is where his, his losses came from. And that is because I know that while I'm, I'm interested in his narrative and his story, and he's lost, albeit to Fury, but he didn't back out of that fight. What's frustrated me with Joshua is he's done everything he can to duck and weave challenging, important fights, and then he lost to a Mexican fatty. <laughs> To be fair, he did take on Usyk. You were giving credit. Uh, for and that. then he took, yeah, he took on Usyk because uh, he thought he was going to be able to beat him. 
Yeah. And I thought he was going to outbox him and walked into the and you know did that first fight like oh I'm going to outbox you then got smashed and I, then it was like I still the next need fight, to see a I'm going to bring it that was impressive and I, it, I'm still, and still, you just yeah. you just go like I I think the point is you're interested in Wilder because he's fought the best of his generation you're not interested not in Joshua down. as much because there are two names. Wilder and Fury who can clearly make fights with other big fighters because they've done it with themselves yeah. that he hasn't fought and therefore why should I take him as seriously as people would have five like years gone, ago every challenge he's gone that way tried to go that way like oh uh, I need a belt oh look Charles Martin's got one <laughs> <laughs> because Gassiev blew out his it was Gassiev wasn't it who blew out no, his uh, can, can, what was, what was the question what was the question <laughs> but no, look, jo Joshua lost respect when he took his shoes off in a hall of residence. Like the only person to ever take their shoes off in a university hall of residence. I have no idea what he's talking about. Those, those yeah. Sheffield students. <laughs> but, but when he confronted the students, and, he, and you were all watching the video go, where are his shoes? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't what stood out to me. Um, next small hall breakthrough fighter. Next small hall breakthrough fighter. Uh, it kind of goes back to before, doesn't it? You don't I mean, have to pick out a British, name. You yeah. might not want to pick out a name. I don't Dennis Jenny Jack, one to watch for. Decent fighter. Emmanuel Break Zeon. I'm really Emmanuel Zeon, Emmanuel, that's a great Emmanuel shout. Emmanuel Zeon. Great shout. Joshua Gustav. Joshua, Joshua Gustav, Gustav, yeah. yeah. Um, with more... George Henry. Can, can I give three? Yeah. Stanley Stannard. Who? Brad Goldsmith. Who? And Brad Bethel. Who? Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah, this is you got what you asked for. This is a, this is a great question because it also just it just says everything we've argued tonight <laughs> in a question. With more major promotions putting on small hall type cards, what does that mean for small hall promoters? I don't think they are. I think is I think it's backhanded. No, what, what? I we just spent half of that card that you'd printed out. With everyone going, not interested in that. But the thing is, I think if it was a small hall card with some of the fights talked about, I think we'd be more interested. I think we're less interested because it's not even it's a small hall fight. But they're coming to card. equivalents. Sure. Would be my argument. We've got a fight next year, Dennis Denikjo versus Tom Ansell. That, for me, That's is as certain as you can be to be a good fight. Yeah. You stick that on an Oprah on Sky, a designer or BT show, People watch that, enjoy the fight, and think, "Okay, that's going to get me excited." They're not I'm interested in those. They want to put poor fights on them. No, you see what I'm saying. People watch that. <laughs> that's and think, a proper fight. That's a really, yeah. and people enjoy it. It's the sort you want to see in boxing. And the Fun Pong other way. Yeah, and the thing is, as well, whoever wins that fight is already then known to the Sky BT audience. And then when they do go and fight an Olympian or something like that, you the, the, the crowd are half already half invested. Well, one part about that that question is that I think if you look at the BT show <coughs> from Telford on Saturday night, none of us particularly know what was on it. Anthony Yard beat up some geezer. They flew in from Asda. Um, <laughs> flew in from, from Asda? Asda. <laughs> um, I, I don't know who else was on it. There was uh, Liam Davis versus Baluta. Outside of those two fights, I've literally got no idea who was even on the card, let alone the fights. So those fights squeeze into that small hall territory almost, don't they? But they, are, but they, are, sure. but they were prospect journeyman, prospect journeyman, prospect journeyman. So I think so that almost... Not, but that's not what you want to see. The TV should be Sam Gilly, Sean Robinson, Dennis Denichev, Tom Ansell, yeah. Frim Pong against Adderway, Ryan Walker, Peter Merger, Jamie Smith, Daniel Mendes, which nearly got on Sky that fight. They, I, go, they were looking at taking it and they didn't. I agree completely. So that question is saying, are they encroaching upon your space almost by no, putting no, on those? No, we'd like that. We'd like them to take them because it gives our fight. I said we're managers first, promoters are second. But it, I suppose the point is, if they're not taking your fight, but they're still taking that same space, is yeah. that a problem? Yeah. Because I think that's what he's really, Frank, never, Frank wasn't doing those kinds of shows for a while, mm. wasn't he? No. And, and that would have been like an Errol Johnson type show. Mm -hmm. I mean, the next the next gen stuff of Matchroom was gone. Frank yeah. Warren had, what did he have? It was called a market. At the school or something as well. Yeah. Years ago. Well, that, 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 Box Academy? Yeah, so, that's like it. Something, that, yeah. That's yeah, gone. Yeah. That's gone. And... Yeah, so it's it, it's it's just where the it only is. thing I would say is they've gone in name. Yeah, yeah that's they right. haven't necessarily yeah. gone, gone in. Yeah, quality. Just, but yeah. you think it's the main shows are them? But yeah. you think Eddie's got the three main fights on on Saturday, which are okay. Yeah, you could you could come to us and say what title fights you got in November September time. We want two area title fights are going to be the best, and we want them to open up our show. This that'd be two great fights they'd get. That's my frustration. You said it the other day. I saw a little video clip that you put. There aren't enough area title or English title. Look at Brad Ray, Tyler Denny on Sky the other day. Number one, it was a cracking fight. Number mm -hmm. two, the amount of traction it got on social media mm -hmm. because it was a fun fight that people cared about. 
more of that, please. It's more. Which it's my, it's mine and Josh's bugbear. We have this conversation on a weekly basis about how why TV promoters don't take those type of fights. That you know, this area title was English title. Which is why that Sunday card is good. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Uh, my, so I, my theory on this is. We don't have enough competitive fights quick enough. One of the ones I remember that I really enjoyed was how quick Linus and Ashley Bailey Demets fought. Yeah. And I think you should get to a certain point where we allow you to have a bit of fluff, a bit of filler, then we need you to be against one of your peers, mm -hmm. right? And we need to start eliminating like these 20 people down to 10, down to five, maybe down to two or three that we can get behind, right? And they should all fight each other. And it's not like, oh, you lost to him here, it's done for you. It's like, well, you might meet each other back around the corner. And I think we need more of those fights. Yeah, we, we, I think we tried to do it. It's what you alluded to earlier, Steve, wasn't it? About we, we can't, it's difficult to say which one's the British title breakthrough, which we talked about earlier, because we don't know yet. We can't compare them with their peers, like you say, Terry, and that's what we try to do, but sometimes it's not always as, as easy as that. But yeah, it definitely, definitely would be uh, more of that. And I think because of the lack of journeymen, fighters need to go in yeah. and have proper fights early. And if they're not good enough, as Terry says... They get to maybe five or six. And if you're then not good enough, because you're selling tickets, working hard. If you're not good enough, you think, okay, that's my level. Or you think, okay, that's for me. I'm going to be done. But find your level and, and get realism about where you are going to go. And I think you're going to have to take, you definitely are going to have to take fights earlier. The, the days of going to 10, 12 and 0 and fighting nobodies, that's, that's gone. That's gone. My biggest disappointment was... When, when the pandemic happened and Eddie said, I'm going to do these fights in my garden. And he, remember, he gave that whole thing almost like a therapy session, wasn't it? He said, I'm, I'm tired of wasting money on these one-sided fights. I only want to talk to guys who want 50-50s, right? That, and that was his whole message through the pandemic. It's going to be 50-50s going forward. You know, we're going to put people in hard fights. And he walked back from that so quickly. <laughs> so what, Eddie had No chance. <laughs> so, to be fair, to, TV promoters don't have the... The en enough fighters to make 50 50s all the time because yeah. they'll be burning through, burning through really quick. Well, if I had a billion dollars, I'd like <laughs> to think that I had enough fighters available to me to make these fights. But he's the only worldwide promoter. <laughs> a billion global dollars. Global if he promoter. got a billion dollars and then he Sorry. put it in his garden, he had to pay for the rent of the garden, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. John Bailey. Uh, did MTK cease or just rebrand? And can you split your opinion on the companies and those that work slash represent them, or would that just be hypocritical? No comment. Anybody want to answer that <laughs> question? No comment. Um, I'll take it. I, <laughs> I, 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 I will say that there's slightly less money in boxing than there was a couple of years ago. Okay, Flash Cannon 2000. Oh, sorry, John. To Flash Cannon 2000 asks, which boxing promoter would you buy a used car off and why? So when you go back to MTK, right? <laughs> <laughs> how is it? Duck and cover. How is it the American government have taken more sanctions against people in British boxing than the British Boxing Board of Control have taken against people in British boxing as a result of everything that went on? Anyone want to answer? I mean, you got to say no. there are there are. <laughs> There are promoters who are sanctioned in America and they're still promoting here. So, and they're not allowed to go into America. But no, then correct. There, not, there no are boxers who aren't allowed to go to America. You are, you, are, you are comparing the US government to the British Boxing Board of Control. Correct. That's so, not the same. What's worse is Robert America. Smith will tell you it is. It's not the same. Right. So why is it that people on another land, many, 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 many miles away, have taken action about something that Im is implicated on these shores? I completely get what you're saying, Martin. However, you've got, you've got to make this two, this two distinct yeah. differences. I, I, I get your it's point. The, it's the US government, which is probably one of the most powerful organizations and how many how many how many people do you think work for the government that brought in these in these sanctions many how many teams many. How, how many give uh, 200,000 okay and the British Boxing Board of Control you're talking about 11 staff tops well, competent ones or <laughs> just staff as in head office staff um, uh, let's go 11 yeah. okay so, right. that's, that's, so a, that's, is, irrelevant, so what, that's irrelevant what is the American government's job to Govern America. America. What's the British Boxing Board of Control's job? Don't you think that, the question? That, 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 that is the question. Sure. The British Boxing Board of Control do boxing. They don't do law. They don't do legal stuff. If they get prosecuted or something in this country, then they have something to do. Absolutely. But why is the US doing it? How can 
how can they do anything? If I get banned in America, is it, a, is it a massive reach, right, for you to can say... I, can I just say something? Or can I just butt in? There's one no. clause in... The, well, I'm going to say one thing, but I'm not going to say anything controversial. This is just general about anybody. And this doesn't go back to MTK. This is a general rule where I go back over British Boxing Board should have been taking people out of boxing for many years. There is a fit and proper rule, right? And a fit and proper rule, which exists in financial services, it excludes in, it's the same clause in boxing, means if you're not considered fit and proper, we, we, you cannot have a license. The issue you might say is, if you've been banned on a foreign shore from entering a country because you're expected, you're presumed to do that, are you fit and proper? But are you fit and proper to some of the things that people have done in the past over here with the way that they've looked after boxing and boxers? Are you fit and proper? And I think we can go back 20, 30 years for that. But there is a fit and proper clause. So that's all I'm saying. But that's the only comment I've got. Oh, but but if our own government and our own police force aren't doing anything, how can the British boxing... All that Absolutely. I will say about it, right, if Absolutely. I'm the British Boxing Board of Control and I've got <laughs> the American government saying there are people here that you need to be pretty careful about, right? Let's, let's just call it that. Yeah, that's fair. Now, at that point, if I'm the British Boxing Board of Control and those people hold licenses under my auspices, some of them promotionally, some of them boxers, some of them management, whatever it may be, and when you've got, and let's make sure that we get this correct, you've also got the McGuigans, who there are lots of stories about, there are court cases with, with Carl Frampton and Barry McGuigan. When you've got all these things going on roughly around the same time, if I'm the British Boxing Board of Control, I say, right, everyone who has money going through their books that are affected by us, they pay taxes into us. So every promoter, every manager, you need to give me a two-year financial audit. And I know that you're going to say, well, a lot of it's cash right that uh, boxing is a lot of cash in cash out right i don't care i want to see where all your money has come in from how many people attended that show you must be able to tell me how much money went back out show me the balance of your books at the end of it and keep that going forever now but i want a full fucking audit for the last 24 months but they could come to us and they can have that there you go no could they do that with everybody in british boxing but but here's my question so here's the challenge martin um You've got some incredibly smart people in the Middle East, just in the whole country, just in general, highly educated, smart people in the Middle East. There's a, there'll be enough handoffs. So that, Martin knows he's never going to yeah. get those things, by the yeah. way. No, no, but there, there, <laughs> that's the point. There, yeah. there, are, there are enough handoffs that you're really just going to be burning time trying to get to the bottom of it. That a handful of people know how this whole thing works. Um, I stay well out of it. I might say something off camera, but uh, it's it's probably bigger than boxing. And if I was yes. boxing, I would wait for someone to give me a solid link that says, if, if there's money being laundered through our sport, show me where, we will investigate that. And I think that's what they're waiting for. I, I do love off camera Terry. He's the best. So I'm not, I'm not labeling anyone, any people in particular. I'm just saying that that was the ideal breaking point whereby you had that court case going on in Ireland with Frampton and the McGuigans. You had all the stuff going on with the American government. That was the point. Somebody should have said, right, just get all your receipts out. Show me all the balances to your books. Let's have it all on yeah. the table. And I expect that clarity going forward forever there's a big spotlight being shown on here just allow me to say that i've done some due diligence well yes. you should be thinking that you there's should. a bbc documentary about it <laughs> <laughs> there's an entire bbc documentary you can't turn a blind eye and yet people have uh do you think eddie slash barry hearn's plans to ultimately sell the business was to sell the business to the zone hence the reason they left sky how badly has that deal backfired Assuming that that was a yes. He's assumed that's a yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's quite clear Eddie doesn't have the pool he had 18, 24 months ago. You see a lot of the prospects either leaving him or just not going to him in the first place. Like a lot of, well, from what, 2012 to 2020, he had the selection of the Olympians, really, mm-hmm. didn't he? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's changed. Has it backfired? It's looking like it so far. It, does, it just doesn't have the same pool he once did. Yeah. I still think he... If he's probably the best promoter in the country for me, for what, just the attraction he gets from the general public. But maybe they, haven't didn't, didn't they haven't the Hearn sold like twenty five percent of their business to an outside investor that they announced a few months ago, mm. didn't they? Well, uh, well I'm not the best person to talk to about that. Jeff, <laughs> to be well, I don't know. I was looking at you, right? you. Martin, Terry. <laughs> Matchroom have darts, snooker, pool, gymnastics. Boxing is just one sort yeah, of, of part of it. 
is that if the zone have all that money, I don't know when those those sports contracts run with until Sky. Given that the zone have nothing other than a bloke like coming off the streets who's got a YouTube channel punching somebody else who's got the same, and a handful of matchroom shows, what else do they show on the zone for like twenty four hours a day? Like, why have they not made more of a move to buy that match that, room? That, they were, obviously, they were trying to buy BT and get some Premier League games. That's that's the changing point for them. In t- for me, it is. But in the meantime, you've got nothing else on. But there. again, with, with them having darts, snooker, and pool, and fishing, those viewing figures for darts are massive. Yeah, I know. But people watch it because it's on Sky Sports. Yeah, yeah. If they didn't have it, I, I, I watch darts when it's on. But if it was on Design, would I make yeah. the effort to go to Design and watch darts? That's Probably it. not. That's no. fair. That's it. I, th- I, th- I think they made the leap too quickly. They saw Netflix booming. They saw, and you know, as a typical example, and they went, right, let's get on this quick. And they, they neglected to realise the value of fresh And, and let, let's be fair to Eddie and Co here. They're a live events company. A pandemic yeah. hit very shortly after they joined the zone, yeah. whereby you couldn't really put on any decent level live events. You lost that atmosphere aspect. The, when it's not there, you miss it. All those things were like a perfect storm yeah. that he ended up in on a platform that nobody knew about outside of a handful of boxing fans. Like yeah. To give Eddie some credit, he, he survived through that. And you've got to look at the zone from a global perspective, right? They're, they're nothing here, they're nothing in the US, but they're significant in most other countries. And so they're doing well in that sense. I think what's happened in the zone, just from the bits I pick up, is their focus has changed from being a content company to being a technology company. That's what, what that normally means is the budget shifts, right? So before Eddie could sit down with the big bosses and talk, but now Eddie's got to go through Joe, who then talks to Shay, who's the CEO now. So Eddie doesn't have that kind of relationship he had with James Rushton, where he could he could almost hoodwink a lot of guys because they didn't know anything about boxing. And now, now they've kind of looked back and said, so all the things you said you've been wrong on, you haven't hit your projections. Josh is not bringing any money in. Now, Canelo's lost to Bivol. Josh has lost to Usyk twice. Your, your prime assets aren't prime anymore. Now, why are we still stuck with you? And you're seeing a greater emphasis now on Oscar, where they're now saying, well, here, Oscar, there you go. DeZone X, there you go. So all the big things that are happening on DeZone, Mayweather comes on DeZone. He doesn't have to ring Eddie Hearn. KSI comes on Logan Paul, uh, on DeZone. He doesn't have to ring Eddie Hearn. No one has to go through Eddie anymore. And you're just seeing him sort of just marginalised because he hasn't delivered. And they gave him the biggest pot and he failed to deliver. Uh, which boxer would you like to buy a used car off? Because we didn't... Which promoter or boxer? Uh, sorry, which boxing promoter? Sorry. Joshua. Promoter? Your promoter. Oh, me? I'll buy a few because I trust you won't rip me off. <laughs> I assume they're in the TV ones. <laughs> no, it doesn't say that. I'm going to play safe. I wouldn't buy a used car off any... Pro- I would buy a few... Mark Nielsen, he seemed like a decent bloke. Yeah, yeah, I'll go with that. Right. Chris Saniger, he sounds like he should sell used cars. Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather fight six Chocolatito-sized Furies or one Fury-sized Chocolatito? <laughs> first one. That's a great question. I'm not fighting one Fury-sized Chocolatito. Absolutely he's not. savage when yeah, he's like yeah, that yeah, tall. Yeah. I don't want him when he's a fully grown adult. Yeah. At least you can kick, you least you kick the smaller one in the head, can't you? That's a great... <laughs> no, I'm not fighting a massive <laughs> Chocolatito. <laughs> All right, with the, I haven't re- pre-read this, so I might stumble it. My question, with the... With the three biggest UK promoters all struggling to sell out arenas toward the end of this year, albeit because of poor cards, and the Middle Eastern sports washing bonanza <laughs> picking up more momentum. Well, we've got some controversial questions will today. We, <laughs> that, that is the people that listen to our podcast. Will we even uh, will we see even less arena slash stadium UK shows in 2023? No, I think the TV TV companies demand arena shows over leisure centres in your call. I think you might see less. I don't know who you're going to get to fill the stadium. What's, what's, the, the, what's uh, this Clever championship work. series over in uh, the Middle East? Well, the Middle East, <laughs> the Middle East that suddenly got a real interest in boxing that it never used to have, and then and golf uh, and everything else, and then some stuff happened, and now the Middle East is putting on a championship series. Cool. Um, is it a golden contract? It's a very golden contract if you if you get that that set up. <laughs> um, I think you'll see more over there, won't you? Like, whether, the, mid- whether the Middle that, East? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Whether that takes away from the product you get here, because let's face it, right, when Chantel Cameron goes and fights for an undisputed world title in the Middle East, 
it loses some interest. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know why that is because the timing's perfectly fine. I just don't really care to watch it in a sanitised Middle Eastern like venue that's sure. a bit of sports washing going on. You know, there's some general washing going on. And um, yeah. no, based upon how how clean all their white clothing is, is, is very good. Well, see, what I'm starting to good think washing. now, what my sort of attitude towards the sports washing is, the reason they're doing it is to try and clean up the Middle East's image. But I think that as time's going on, what it's, what it's actually doing is tainting the sport. So their tainted reputation is, is tainting the sports and the organisations. FIFA has clearly been tainted by Qatar. Yeah, that's an extreme, though, isn't it? But like Bo- they're, they're boxing has clearly been tainted by when, like, when... When, when they, when they, were, they were getting lots of criticism and they were doing it in Saudi Arabia for the same for the same reasons, and you don't come away from it going, you know what, Saudi Arabia's all right. You come away <laughs> thinking, what were they doing? But you say that F1, who's been going, is at, in what was it Abu Dhabi? They've done the last um, Grand Prix. That sport's just exploding in popularity. They they go to some countries they shouldn't go to, and they don't get any they don't get any flack for it, do they? I, I just I this I don't think people look at Formula One as a, a bastion of integrity, and Formula One is rubbish. You know, <laughs> I'm with it's you. Huge sport, absolutely. It's it's huge. Adult skeletal shit. It is so that much, and cricket. I just shit. think there's so much money involved that generally people go, there must be corruption there. Well, that's no, what well, I just. I just think people just well, do. You don't look at Formula One and go, they're good people. I, uh, which is that not most sports though? Yeah. But look at boxing, Andy, right? That's they big. also don't virtue signal. F1 doesn't tend to virtue signal, whereas FIFA going up on stage, we want to bring football to the uh, reaches Today of the I world. am a homosexual. Oh, yeah, what? Is. You're what? <laughs> that was a weird Only speech. today as well. Like, <laughs> what are you doing in <laughs> for today? I feel African. <laughs> yeah. That's very strange. But, but in terms of boxing, people have to get their money out of the sport before this thing goes south, right? And if you can't get your money in the US... You can't get your money in the UK. You're just going to have it in the Middle East. There's money's going to be moving across. You know, you can get paid in your FTT tokens if you want. You can, I mean, it, it's it's easier to do business in the Middle East, and it's no coincidence you're starting to see boxers base themselves out of there. I think Rocky Fielding's now Dubai based, right? Um, Lawrence looks like he's heading that way, and I think you're going to see that wave start to happen because. Um, in reference to one of your earlier questions, the money in the sport hasn't really changed. The location of that money's changed. And it's about whether you want to go to that or not. It's all in combat chain now. Uh, this next question, we can, we've, we've answered combat a lot of chain. points already. Mm. Um, mm. But Will Scott asks, um, Eddie appears to be in serious decline. What have been his three biggest mistakes? He argues that it was leaving Sky, not signing Fury, and he argues that he should have fed Ben to the Wolves. <laughs> can, I, can I just pick up on the Fury point? We had Derek Chisora fighting in Monaco. Was it 2016? Yeah, when 2017? No, the Caballero fight. Caballero, yeah. yeah. Monaco. And Tyson Fury was there. <laughs> and this is when he was talking about his comeback, he was meeting with Hearn. And he walked past me, and I kid you not, he had, he had um, some Chino shorts on and a belt. The, the fat on his back was going over the belt and going down to his ass. I said to my friends, he is never, ever, ever <laughs> fighting again. No way could you be in that sort of condition. Like, he was literally just standing there sweating. Like, he was in a bad way. So, from her perspective, you can understand, I think, why am I going to start agreeing to pay all this money for a man that's probably never, ever going to fight again, let alone win a fucking but, world but, title? But I'm not going to agree to pay for something that's not guaranteed. Oi, design. <laughs> <laughs> but he, but he did make him an offer though, didn't he? Yeah, but you're not. Yeah. But for me, you're not gonna be that. Boy. If I was Eddie Hearn, I'd be like, and someone oh, outbid you, you might go. Yeah, yeah. Good, good luck to you. He's not gonna fight anyway. Yeah. yeah. I think the only other one that I'd add onto that list is not signing Daniel Dubois. And I know Daniel Dubois has got that loss now to to Joe Joyce, but he's rebuilt. Warren's rebuilt Dubois very well, very well. Mm-hmm. We s- and he's got years ahead of him. We said this a little while ago, all three of us actually. The biggest mistake we thought Hearn was making at the time, he wasn't signing any of the fights coming through. He was just too obsessed with signing the Olympians. The Daniel Dubois, the Lana Shadovis. He doesn't he doesn't he hasn't signed those type of people for years, and I think that's finally biting him in the eye. You, you think his Perrin, focus yeah, was yeah. channeled. He was like laser focused on Joshua for a while. Yeah, exactly. Felt, felt he, he wasn't signing the people that were coming through, and that and I think that's what's I think that's what you've seen Ben Shalom do and Frank Frank do that Eddie hasn't, and that's why Terry, you've said that for years, didn't you? That he he's not He's not a hardcore boxing person to that degree, whereby Warren might have his links into the Peacock 
and everyone yeah, knows who's coming so, through. I think it's hard for promoters, right? Steve's got shows to put on. What Steve can't do is Steve can't be at that show in Northampton. He can't be that show in Derby watching the young kids go through. So if, if you're in Steve's position, what you do is you go, I need four or five people whose eye that I trust, right? Four or five people whose eye that I trust implicitly. And if they come to me and say, there's a kid that's boxing out of Far Cotton in Northampton, but he stopped seven people in a row. And then Steve will go, but is he, he, can he cut it at this level? It's like, I think he can. Chin will get tested, but I think he can. That's what Steve needs. Steve doesn't want to be doing the, the hard road work. No promoter does. And I think what happened with Eddie, and this has happened with Frank as well, but Frank's had to reset. They lose touch with what's really happening, what's bubbling. And so guys will come up to you. And it, I'll give you a prime example. Sky signed a few heavyweights, right? Sight unseen. They took the word from people who they thought knew what they were talking about. I got a phone call. What do you think of so-and-so? What do you think of so-and-so? I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, they're both going to get smoked. As soon as you put them against someone that can punch, they're both going to get smoked. You're better off cutting your losses while you can. Why? Because I'd seen both of them fight. I knew that they didn't have it in them. And so promoters need that. And Eddie needs that. But he's such a polarizing figure. He, he, He's not, a, he's not a people person. He, he may talk the, the talk on camera, but he's not a guy that you really see around crowds and around people. So no one's really going to go up to him and try and help him. He, and he hasn't helped himself. And that's what, he, that's what happens. A lot of promoters just, they lose that because they don't surround themselves with the right eyes and ears. Two more questions to go. Uh, morning, Steve. Well, well, that's applicable now. Any regrets over the decision to sign promotional agreements for Pauls and Eudofia with the Wassermans given the abrupt ending to the agreement by yeah. Castella King? Who, who yeah. loves them? Any regrets? Any regrets? So, okay, so here we go. So when we signed them, Sky had just started out and Sky were not really signing anybody. And I had them sort of sitting there ready to go. So at that point, Eddie wasn't signing that sort of level of fighter. And Wassermans were looking to build Channel 5 at that point. So do we wait and hope Sky signed them? Or do we sign with Wassermans? So we signed with Wassermans on a one-year contract. The contract um, runs a year unless the promoter serves notice 30 days before that year contract and wants an extension. Wassermans did not serve that notice. So I text them and I just said, oh, you, both of my boys are out of contract now. Um, you've not served an extension. At that point, Brad Pauls was supposed to be fighting on the 25th of November, had a fight, he was training for it. And they, I said, and what's happening with Brad's fight? Oh, we're not doing that anymore. So he's in training, we're now three weeks away from a supposed date. And they just said, oh, he's not. and Linus was supposed to be doing a six-rounder. Oh, they're not, he's not doing it anymore. I said, well, they're out of contract. Obviously, we're not hap they're not happy that they've been training for a fight. But the contract's out anyway. So the I said, they're out of contract. And then the next thing was that they went on social media and announced that they terminated the contract. Well, there was no contract to terminate. They were out of contract. And I don't know why they did that. There was no need. We could have just said, look, you back Linus in the fight with Bentley. Thank you very much. You've, you've built, you've given Brad a a platform, thank you very much. We come to the end, you haven't done your, you haven't served an extension and we're gonna leave. And obviously you didn't do the, f you weren't at the end doing the same job you were doing before. But but I didn't actually, under, I did text them and said, why have you done that? Because then- and What was the reply? Oh, well, you know- Sorry mate, just off some YouTubers, texting a bit. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was just, it was just, I said that, why did you do that? I said, you, you know, we were doing, oh, well, okay, then I was just a bit peeved. We, we can sit down and talk, but, it's, it's so done it was now. a face saving exercise. Yeah, it was a face saving mm. exercise. And I thought it was a very strange thing to do because they, they made it look like they'd been them and they hadn't been them. Right. And and in the meantime I I was preparing things in the background, knowing full well they wouldn't they probably didn't realise they needed to serve it. So we had the Brad Paul's Tyler Denny thing there, um, which um, is now mandatory. We knew that was coming, so that's gonna be on Sky. And obviously now Linus is free of contract, I can have talks with other parties about signing them. So it's perfectly fine, 
But I just didn't see the need to, to go on social media and say that and make it look like they'd been them. He hadn't been them. They were out of contract. The I contract see, come to the end. I didn't see the need to go on social media and say that. That's about 90% of all social media interaction in the history of social media. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag boxing Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> um, by, the way, by the way, I do want to say one thing. They've done a good thing with Linus. They gave him home advantage against Denzel Bentley. And so I'm not slating them off by any stretch of the imagination. So I'm, I don't like. I don't think they've done the right thing at the end with the fights, not doing the fights. And it showed you that they didn't care. In my opinion, they weren't care. They didn't care anymore, and they didn't do the right thing in the end. But they done. They really did a good thing with Linus and Denzel Bentley. But towards the end, they didn't care. Sounds honest. Sounds fair. Um, Ross asks question for all of you. So everyone, I think, should chime in. If you had a magic wand. <laughs> that you could change one thing in the sport of boxing, what would it be? It's a bit that Kev's going to edit out later. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be sticking a boxing draft in. Sorry, Terry. <laughs> Sorry, Martin. <laughs> uh, I think the um, the one for me, which is controversial, which I mentioned the other day, which I don't think has come out yet, the one thing I would like to see is I would like to see in title fights them announce the scorecards at round three, six, and nine. Boxing is the only sport where we give advice not knowing the score. No other sport you play not knowing the score. Don't play boxing, Kev. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got corners given as ever. You've got you've got corners given advice on cards on how they think it happens and how they think they're seeing it, when in reality no one has any idea. So I know that's controversial, I know people don't like it, but I think that would help. The, it's the, the only sport we don't know the score. The only counter argument I can give to that, was it Canelo versus Austin Trout, where they tried open scoring after three, six, nine? Mm -hmm. And Canelo then just cruised from like sure. nine to twelve sure. because he knew he was far enough ahead and there was no point taking a risk. Sure. Is there a risk that is Yeah, there you a get that anywhere that, though, don't you? I, you do I, get that. I like not knowing. Yeah, I see. I, th from a, from a fan's point of view, it's good. From a corner's point of view, it's horrific. But, but, I was going to say, wait, which, which lens are you looking at it? From? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, but, but you're still trying to get your guy to win, regardless. Sure. Right? And the fight's still the fight. Yeah. If that makes sense. So if if I've got a corner and I'm like, look, <laughs> he keeps dropping his backhand whenever he's throwing that jab. Yeah. Just faint, throw the hook. I'm still going to say that whether you're you're three rounds down or nine rounds down, right? It, I may start shouting and screaming after the last one to say, you know, pull your finger out. But I think as a corner, you generally get a feel for where the fight's going. Now, when it's tight, yeah, I'm with you. But we'd still complain about scorecards. Look, we had VAR. We thought VAR would solve a lot of problems, <laughs> yeah. right? And it's just caused more problems. Do you I just, I'd say... More retirements? Do you think, like, if you were, if you were four, four or five rounds down uh, rounds down with three rounds to go do you think people will just go nah. <laughs> yeah, but potentially I, I, I just I, I, I think it would help I think it would help you might see the one thing I like about football is using the football analogy um, Dillian White Fulham um, is um, Norwich. Norwich. yeah or Norwich um, is the fact that if you 2-0 down they take off a defender and throw another striker on and it changes the dynamic of the game I'm not saying that would happen it can obviously change the dynamic for the worse the other team, the team that's two ahead, could bring another defender and shut up shop, and that could happen in boxing, like you say. But um, that's just for me personally. I'd like to see that. Really I would like to see someone who's ahead who then sits back and goes, "Oh, I've got of course, you get that in football, right?" And that's but what Canelo did against Trump. Absolutely, yeah. But then isn't capable of actually holding off. Sure. He's caught because he gets complacent. That could happen as well. Sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, that would be my change. Going anyway, back to your thing about like, would people retire? I think boxers on the whole are so deluded. Yeah. <laughs> whereby they might be, you know you might have someone who's in against Sonny Edwards with three rounds to go and they're six rounds down they'll still believe they'll back themselves that they can yeah, knock and you out want Sonny Edwards to do that though of right? course Don't you, you do you. and yeah, like yeah, if, and to be fair to turn my own argument around if that means that you get one boxer coming out and just swinging for the hills for three rounds yeah. like we didn't see on Saturday night in absolutely. the Yeg Benike versus Josh fight mm -hmm. if you saw that then I'm all for that I'm and part for... part of that comes from the inability for a lot of people to read a fight, a lot of trainers, not some, some are very good, but some are really poor at reading a fight. And that's detrimental to a fighter sometimes because they give information yeah, based on the thing. That would be my change anyway. Toddlers, right? The Eubank senior said it. You've got toddlers, I mean, in the corner. Yeah, so, I mean, Todd, Todd is, is, is a sweeping statement, but it's... Uh, but and not all, there are a lot of good ones out there as well, but it's... Um, there, are, there, yeah. are, there are a lot of toddlers. I, 
<laughs> Terry loves a sweeping statement. Yeah. Well, no, no, but sometimes I'll watch, I'll watch something, or you talk to a coach, right, and they'll say something, and you're just like, oh, my God, like someone's trusting their career with you. Mm-hmm. Look, I, look, I, was, I was house second for Frank Warren for years, right, and that was great experience for me, for being in the corner, seeing so many high-level trainers and seeing so many. It is eye-opening. It is eye-opening what some people say in some corners. And there's some really, really good ones. Really, really good ones. And there's some that's really, really not good. And it, it is really stuff. If you had to break them up, Kev, as like, what percent... I'm not asking you to name names at all, sure. but like, what percentage were really good? What percentage were okay and they might get better in the future? They might be young, they're learning, etc. You, you'll accept that. And what percentage shouldn't have held a license? There, there's, there's, there's a lot that, that's... Training license... I think are easy to come by and that's one thing I'd like to see made a little bit harder um, but on the flip side of that I think trainers are one of the most unsung heroes in in boxing they do a lot of work for not a lot of money they're not protected by any contract whereas a manager is or anything else like that um, they're great people they put in so much hours and that if it however there are some that are, are completely incompetent um, and that's dangerous, but that's a that's a whole other that's a whole other episode. Well dodged, but, but, Kev. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, but <laughs> I, encourage, I encourage anyone if you can ever be around one of those old time trainers who are good, just stand next to them and watch a fight, and mm-hmm. you'll realize that your eyes and their eyes are not the same because mm-hmm. they will see stuff. Like a guy will say, "Yeah, you see what he's doing now." Yeah, yeah. That's the, that's just a little bit too much. He's not going to be able to do that by round four. Mm-hmm. And you're like, okay, whatever. And then by round four, what happens? They start to tie. It's like, yeah, I told you. Now, they, and they can almost call how the fight will go. And you just sat there going, oh man, like when do I get to that level? <laughs> yeah, Josh, your magic wand. <laughs> um, mine would be reduce the amount of titles people could fight for. Well, mainly in this country. I'll limit it to area, English, British, Commonwealth, European, and world only. That's a great shout. But what about diamond belts? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> we, won the, we won the interim retirement diamond silver belt. I think if you limit the amount of titles, I think you force people to fight each other because otherwise they haven't yeah. got a title topping the bill on TV. And Absolutely. I think that would improve the product. That's yeah. a great shout. Yeah, very good. Really good. Steve? Okay. So mine is from personal experience. Anybody found poaching a boxer or speaking to a boxer under contract gets a five-year ban and a five-year ban from attending events. Any unlicensed person who masquerades as a licensed person or interferes gets a five-year ban from attending events. The board say they can't take license away from unlicensed people, but they can ban them from attending boxing shows. That is almost impossible to enforce. Well, it will. I think, I think if you do it and then they get reported, you can, you can deal with it. I think it might be impossible. You need to do something to discourage the amount of people that try to tap up boxers under contract. It's a real problem, yeah, for sure. Mine? It's the point where Kev's going to make a mark <laughs> and no. then edit me out later. <laughs> Oh God. Well, I've been looking forward to seeing Kev's face as well. <laughs> <laughs> Is the precise introduction for the British Boxing Board of Control. Thank you very much. <laughs> I would rip them up and start again. He muted me. <laughs> no, 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 he's still there. <laughs> uh, look, and I realise you lot don't have to make any comment about this. I just think the way that things have been handled, I go back to that MTK, that McGuigan stuff, I go back to the way that drug, high profile drug cases have been handled over the last 18 months. It's not to say there aren't good people at the British Boxing Board of Control, because I believe fundamentally there are. I just think they maybe don't have the power to implement things that they would perhaps like to do. Now, whether that means that they need to be resourced two, three times. You said earlier, Kev, there's 11 people maybe that were there full time. Make that 50 people. Now they get the power to do stuff. Give them government backing. Now give them the ability to do stuff. But what I think is that you have a name and a body that is tainted beyond the point whereby people can fully respect what they do now, whereby they would need to be disbanded, new people brought in, new roles potentially beefed up, whether that means government intervention to give them the power that they require to be able to say, right, give me your financial books. You, you failed a drugs test, you're banned, you're not allowed anywhere near this sport for the next four years. Don't care what you can say, you're banned. 
whatever it may be, right, no, you're not licensed, you can't come into this event. All these things, whether that needs government intervention, I appreciate the moment the government start intervening in boxing, the sport probably shuts down anyway because of the levels of corruption that have happened over the years and where some of the money comes from, etc., etc., etc. But to me, you can't have a British boxing board of control that continues in the manner that it does. And if there were a good viable alternative at the moment, such as Bieber, oh that was run by people that were competent and good, then it would have come to power already. Those other options are trash. Absolute trash. And... <laughs> if even Terry's like yeah how was, was it? Uh, <laughs> they, in, in the board's defence you cannot put them in the same bracket as Bieber no no I'm not I'm not putting them in there at all what I'm saying is if they were any good they would have come up with a viable alternative to the board they're so bad that they haven't they were going to licence Nigel Benn <laughs> under a medical expert I can promise you if you go back and find whoever it was is not a medical expert in brains um so, yeah, my, my one thing would be that the board should be disbanded and a new board set up with a, a beefier uh, weight behind it and whether that involves being government licensed, which it isn't at present, so that it makes them the official one as well. Because at the moment, as yeah, you that's, said earlier... I was, about, I was about to ask you, do you not think some of the issues the board face would be uh, would be reduced or stopped by being actually affiliated by the government the board yeah the, yes what i'm saying so like, the board would have more power have more perhaps. funding but i think the moment you do that the government starts saying okay right now give me all your money now give me but they don't you look at, i think i think i think the british books would welcome that i think they've been pushing for government funding for years yeah which is good good on them i think they, um, they, they, they i mean it's the government but, don't want to get involved but, in but yeah then you start having the problem of when somebody dies in a british ring sure then the government are linked and Absolutely. governing something that has allowed not murder, but manslaughter. Government yeah, don't like this sport. The government yeah. regularly try to shut this yeah. sport. So, so that would be my one thing, is that I'm not saying the board has bad people or that they're corrupt or anything like that. I just think they've gone so far down that path of disrespect from the sport that it needs to be started again with more weight behind it. Okay, because my first thought is uh, boxing was always heralded as separate. You know, like you said that you joked, like joked earlier. You don't play boxing. People within boxing always put it as a special case. There's lives on the line, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, why don't you just make all boxing illegal unless it's within this governing body? I don't under, don't really get why that would be a problem. I 100% yeah. agree. Agree. So yeah. If you did that, then you would have the power to say you can't come into these venues because then everything's in one house. But that's back to government intervention, isn't it? That's exactly what they're yeah, asking for. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But just make it just just <laughs> fundamentally say, as opposed to well, if you've got a if you've got a BBBFC of the equivalent, everything except for this new body, whatever you call it, British boxing, BB, yeah. and, and it doesn't stop boxing. It still allows yeah, exactly. like white collar boxing, amateur boxing. Yeah. all these things can happen, but they're properly governed. Yeah, and white, white w separate subject. White collar boxing does need to be um, regulated <laughs> more than yeah. anything really. Hundred percent. And, and and every every different level can have a different amount of components, i.e., like brain scans and stuff like that. So you can't just go, he hasn't let me fight. I'm gonna go and fight him. And then become a vegetable, and stuff like, you know, whatever. Anyway, but to sorry. defend the board, though, they they are a bit more militant on brain scans now. You're seeing a mm. lot of people yeah. fall out the sport. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you if you see someone, you're like, where's he been for the last few years? That's probably what it was. Uh, yeah, their, their their medical things are the best out of everybody. No, out there, that's for sure. They they're, they're, their medical checks might be, but again, I would go back to that archaic way of thinking. <laughs> When was the last time the equipment in boxing was changed? And I mean, when was it researched? When was, it, when was there any money put into our boxing gloves made of the right things? Our head guards made of the right things? Mm -hmm. Our head guards shaped in the correct way to mm -hmm. protect the brain for all those hours of sparring that you do building up to fight? It's when was the last it, time... The old man used to wear it sure. Would it fundamentally protect a boxer if they were allowed ice tonics in the corner more so? Uh, exactly. All these questions. There was, there, was, there was a big thing about that. Adam Booth done a thing about that, about applying um, 
to try and get something like that. Um, but yeah, it was rejected. That, those parts I get in, in terms of that. The actual medical itself is, is very good. No, the, the medical the thing, yeah, absolutely. cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm down with that. Yeah, I understand there's potentially more, there's more research could be did. That's but, but, but there's point. easy wins. There's e- My brother lives around the corner from the board and mm-hmm. he, you know, he works in this field. He's approached the British Boxing Board of Control and said, I'll do some work with you around. Mm-hmm. He's working with the Welsh FA. He's working with, um, sorry? WRU. The RFU, the WRU, is working with the NFL, all these different sports that are embracing concussion protocols, research into head damage, and yet he's approached the board and said, look, it won't cost you. We'll work with you. We'll do this research for you. He's got nothing back. Mm -hmm. And that's disgusting. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely disgusting. So next time someone dies in a British ring... And you get all these crocodile tears from people at the board, people that are promoters, people that are this, that, and the other. I can tell you now, there have been approaches from people within the medical world to do work with them, and they've heard nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Well, Disgusting. We, we should have fixed all of this. Like, the, the intra-fight fluid intake, you could have sorted that. The board could have said, here's what we'll do. We're going to work with these scientists to come up with these drinks. And on fight night, you're given the bottles, right? Sealed yeah. bottles. Everyone gets the same bottles. Sealed bottles. There you lot go. Nothing else. Don't bring your little secret water or none of that Panama Lewis stuff. <laughs> Just use this. And that's yeah, None of pouring it in the stands. Oh, someone's filming with the camera. Yeah. <laughs> Federer. Oh, no, sorry, Djokovic. Yeah. Isn't it? yeah. yeah. I didn't say the name, but yeah. <laughs> well, it is out there. It's not me. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Uh, Terry, what was your... Uh, Magic wand. wand. Magic wand. I think mine will never change. You shouldn't be allowed to box as a professional without at least 40 amateur bouts. 40? 40. What's the average someone comes to you guys with? Ish. I mean, a couple of them have seen a boxing ring before. <laughs> <laughs> it's so no, it, it's, it varies. It really varies. Some some come with huge, um, extensive amateur careers. Some come with, with I'd, not many. I'd say the ones that... from. I have no evidence for this because I'm just going off the top of my head. But I'd say the boxers that generally go to achieve more, the ones that seem to be between like the 15 and 30 mark for yeah. us. Yeah, yeah agreed. Yeah. Take Fabio Woodley, he wouldn't have got a license. No. And, and, and I would say that the ones that have had, I'd agree, the ones that have had 50, 60, 70 amateurs are now don't do as well as the ones that have had less. And I, I don't know why that is. I, I agree. Some of them, if they've had too many, can be ingrained. But I do agree with Terry's point that although there is Fabio Wardley as the example, he is the exception to the rule. You'll get more sort of boxers that maybe shouldn't be pro boxers that don't have very many than you will have Fabio Wardleys that didn't have many. Well, the board have got so strict of it recently, haven't they? They have, yeah. Only, they've made it harder to get a license. Only in the world. southern area. No, it's yeah. nationwide now, isn't it? No. So, well, so up north, you can get a license without any amateurs. I've been, I've been told it's been changed now. Well, I've been told it hasn't. So, so here's, fight, the, fight. here's the challenge you've got, right? When a kid walks into a gym, however old they are, from zero bouts to 40 bouts, you can guess they've been in that gym for at least three to four years, mm-hmm. right? So they've had to go through that routine of making weight and looking after himself and being accountable for getting up and running. So when Steve says, what's the kid like? I don't have to say, well, he's lazy, right? You're not going to be lazy and get to 40 bouts. You get found out. Whereas, so you, you minimize your risk. It's not a guarantee of success, but you minimize your risk. I think when you get some of these kids who go, right, I've been jobbing in my last three fights. You know, I'm 11 and three now. I'm just going to go and turn over with Steve. They'll look the part yeah, when their career's managed well, right? They'll look the part. And then they'll have that crunch time where they've got to fight someone of their generation who's had more amateur bouts, who's been through that process, done it, done it the, as they say, the proper way. And they'll get found out. And there's, there's a reason why when you look at the world champions, they all have extensive amateur backgrounds. They all do. And you know, what happened when they tried to manufacture Conor Ben and grandfather him into a world title shot? No one had any confidence in him because... They're just some things you don't want to be learning in eight or ten ounce gloves. You, you, the fear factor is too great. Was it the kid Carl Sladden that you guys had? Yeah. Never sparred in ten ounce gloves before he turned pro. Can you imagine getting hit by ten ounce gloves for the first time, fully wrapped hands, and all you've had is a few amateur bouts for Islington, and he got hit. And if he was being honest, he'd say I didn't fancy it after that because it got very real. And I think we need to start minimizing you know, those sorts of situations. And let's just have 
Like you said, Andy, let's have a proper ecosystem. Kids do their time in the amateurs, right? And it gives them time to promote themselves and get themselves known and do, do all that Instagram nonsense you need to do, but do it in the shadows. And then by the time they come to Steve, hopefully if they've been at the right club, they're good to go. And you haven't got to go, oh God, he can't even jab. Oh, he can't defend himself. And so it's, it's a better product for you in the long run. I do, I do actually agree that there should be a minimum. I think 40 is probably a tad too high, but I think the, the general idea is spot They're on. trying to go that way, aren't they, the board? So <laughs> it's a step in the right direction. But yeah, I think I, I agree with Terry. I, I always like There just... was somebody sat around this table, I won't name who it was. Um, certainly wasn't Andy. Um, <laughs> Poor <laughs> Andy. I was thinking, I was waiting for it to be really ludicrous, and I was like, oh, probably was not <laughs> <laughs> They said... Uh, I always love it when amateurs turn over and tell me that they've uh, they've got a, prof- a style. I'm purposely not looking to my life. Uh, <laughs> tell me they've got a style that's made for the pros. All that means is that as an amateur, they just kept getting hit. <laughs> 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 made for the pros. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I told you that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Andy, what is yours? <laughs> yeah. From a ultimate casual. Well, I've got a magic wand, so I would take all of your ideas and steal them. And then, <laughs> no, I, but for me, it's organization, as we sort of spoke about. Like, my frustration with boxing has always been, uh, even from the very outset when we started the podcast, walking into it, you just, what's going on? And it's like, it's like someone has stuck a grenade into a sport and it's gone boom. And they're like, and he, yeah, when he goes with him, and then actually, you should, well, he would fight him, but, you know. His granny's on the wrong menstruation cycle, so you know, <laughs> it's, 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 it's so complicated, so convoluted. So he took her and medicine. It, so, so there's there's so many in there's times when there's ego gets in the way of logic as as much as anything else, and I think the the mini story, the whole Joshua Fury Wilder triumvirate, the way that that has played out is just a lesson to how boxing can fail, can succeed, and can get in its own way. Like, Fury Wilder was unmitigated success as far as I'm concerned as a casual, and the fact that the other two fights still am there's no chance of them being made, is just an absolute- To, to be fair, failure. Andy, um, we still haven't had Lennox Lewis versus Riddick Bowe. Huh? A lot of us are still waiting. <laughs> So it's always next year. Yeah. Always Andy, next year. To back up your point, right, and just uh, hopefully it highlights it. Andy and I play on the same football team. We turned it was Sunday morning stuff. Turned up on a Sunday morning. I was chatting with um, I can't remember who it was. One morning, and it was the the morning after a Saturday night where there'd been some. Bo- it wasn't like world title fight boxing, but it was other boxing that was on. And um, someone said to me, said I've got an interest in sports. Said, Oh, did you see the fight last night? Started talking about what I'd seen. And he was like, no, I didn't mean that. I mean, I've watched, I've watched the one on Sky. And I'm like, oh, I didn't watch that. So when you say it's like a hand grenade, it's just gone off. Yeah. The organization, like you can't, it's not sustainable to have a sport where you've got two different shows on going on the same night. Saturday night, we're going to have it. Um, with the zone with, uh, we've, talked about it right at the beginning you've got White and Franklin you've got uh, Ryder and um, uh, Jack Parker just to sorry Martin just to kind of, you've run a poll on that what was the what was the results so you run a poll this weekend both shows shown at the same time yeah, what which one are what? you going to pick who what was the winning yeah, is this the, the big event? question though is how much is about the judging because it is a, I know you fancy Ryder but I think it goes to points so the question is, it is a Warren fighter. So what, so what did the Twitter... Oh, well, we saw what they did to Daryl, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, the Twitter poll, 335 votes. Uh, 61% Parker Ryder, 39% White versus Frank. Okay. But so I think Frank, more important than any of that is last time John Ryder went on a Frank Warren show. Have you ever read into um, the treatment that Barry Hearn got? Mm. Was that when he fought um, Billy Joe Saunders? It was, yeah. Yes, I did read that. Oh, go and read it. There's an entire article somewhere where, like, Barry Hearn gave his account of what happened. Do you know who? Do you know, do, do, do Andy you know Ayling. Is our best mate who wrote the article. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Ayling then wrote the article in response yeah. to Barry Hearn. You'll find it online somewhere. Just Google John Ryder, Billy Joe Saunders, Andy Ayling. You'll find it on, like, boxing scene. Boxing whatever, scene, like, yeah. 2014. Really? It's 
fucking hilarious. It's talking about like how the Jaguar was treated and um, the VIP treatment that people expected, and then it's the the, the response back. It, well, who wrote that? Andy Ailing. Yeah. Is he grassing again? <laughs> <laughs> So just have a read of it. Honestly, go and find it. It's hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. Shows you the pettiness. It's the kind of pettiness whereby I wouldn't get you a beer earlier. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, we didn't uh, talk about that. Now that was shit house yeah, That Thank was. You very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um is that it? Are we done for questions? Yeah. Questions are all done. I back back to you, sir. Well, I don't think we've got I mean, after two hours and fourteen minutes, I'm not really sure if we've got much more to say, have we? Um no look, gentlemen, thank you for coming. We we appreciate um you're sorely missed your podcast. I know um the Twitter fans for you guys have uh, missed you and we appreciate you coming onto the show and, and joining us and I know we've taken some of your airtime. I know you normally had three hours to yourself, so uh but no we appreciate I'm sure we'll do it again sometime if uh if the people want it and if people have enjoyed Two in hours and fifteen minutes of people would be like, "What the f- happened to Ringle? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What well, a or, mess!" Or more the other way, what happened to New <laughs> Age Boxing ever Podcast again? This <laughs> yeah. what I want, Magic Wand. No, <laughs> none of those lot back again. <laughs> but no, thank you, thank you for coming on. Really appreciate you doing it. It was fun to do it with you guys, and hopefully we'll do it again. Um, I think that wraps up first. Steve, are we doing any more Ring Talk for the rest of the year, or ne- are we next week? Next week, we're carrying it on all through the thing. So, yes, yeah, so we'll be back next week with um, Ring Talk as normal without these three clowns. But, um, no, I appreciate you coming on. And uh, thank you for joining us. And we'll catch you next week. Before you week. go, shout out to Terry, by the way, on his Highfield Boxing Podcast. Yeah, you absolutely. you can find him, if you've enjoyed seeing Terry, he still has his own platform. Go on, Terry. Terry, Come Terry, g- give, us a, give us a plug. Give, us a, give it a plug. Just <laughs> Beyond Boxing, um, iTunes, Spotify, and SoundCloud. God, I've got it. Anywhere you get good podcasts. Well, yeah. Um, apart from Anchor. Don't think we touch that. And then Twitter, obviously, at Highfield Boxing. Um, you know, the only person to ask Eddie to tell the truth were their two tests. <laughs> and everyone was just like, oh, you're such a conspiracy theorist. And I was like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and how often do you do that podcast? Is it weekly, Terry? Sometimes it's weekly. Sometimes it's twice a week. Okay. Twice a week? Okay. Sometimes, yeah. It's the number one podcast in the sport. Uh, <laughs> it will, it will it be after now. this. Yeah, it will be after this. No, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, and we'll uh, catch up with you soon. And we'll see you all again next week. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having us.